Bueno, ¿se me oye bien? Bueno, vamos a sentarnos, vamos a empezar el simposio. Eh, les quiero decir que este simposio está armado con gente que de alguna manera está ligada a un proyecto de Conacyt que ya es antiguo, tiene cinco años, eh, en el cual yo soy el coordinador, eh, que se llama exactamente como el simposio, la física en sistemas, eh, en redes y sistemas dinámicos complejos. ¿no? Eh, y bueno, es un gusto tenerlos reunidos aquí a todos, los que pertenecen al proyecto, eh, para que tengamos una discusión sana, académica, y para conocernos por lo que porque ya sabemos que la pandemia nos cambió la cara a todos. ¿no? Ahora tenemos caras bidimensionales en Zoom. De hecho, en este momento tenemos al público en el Zoom, no lo tenemos aquí. Pero bueno, eh, quiero dar la bienvenida a, lo, a la doctora profesora eh, Cecilia Nogués, que durante los últimos cuatro años fue la directora de este instituto. ¿no? Eh, como son las cosas, ayer dejó de serlo, pero de todas formas ella está invitada a inaugurar este acto y a darles la bienvenida. Cecilia, por favor. ¿En español? Sí. Well, uh, good morning. Well, uh, when I was invited to to open in the symposium, I I told uh, Rafael that probably he, I won't be here like a director, and he said, uh, "Well, you know, Rafael, no, it doesn't matter to me." And uh, well, I I have been with Rafael so many times, so many years. Uh, more than 40 years ago that we met, or uh, life is like that, no? And uh, after that, uh, I entered to the physics school here in Mexico in the Faculty of Science. And uh, he, he taught me a, a couple of courses. Uh, Gerardo was there, Gerardo García Naomis, no? We are uh, believe it or not, we are more or less of the same age, you know? uh, probably because I was uh, four years at the direction. I more, I have more white hair, but uh, <laughs> we are more or less of the same age. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm very happy because uh, well, Rafael, uh, because I, I'm meeting so many people that uh, I know for many years also, Cecilia, Kimo, that uh, also we have met uh, several times. I, I, I don't do anything about uh, networking and uh, networks or dynamic systems, but uh, of course I have followed some of the, the works that you have done. So for me, it's a big honor to be here and to open this uh, symposium, like uh, Rafael say, said, uh, I don't know if it is true or not, but Rafael said this, it means uh, drinking together, no? So I was drinking coffee, no? Together this morning with you. And uh, well, uh, welcome to the Physics Institute. This is still my institute. It has been for the last, uh, I entered here at uh, 1988 for, as a student, so uh, so many years ago, no? Uh, so welcome to this uh, institute, and uh, I wish you the, the best for this symposium. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a very nice symposium with a very nice person that I met so many years ago, and you too, because of that you are here, and I wish you the best. Thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you. Right. Before starting, we have five minutes. 
Uh, I, I will tell you about the mechanics of the symposium. There will be morning sessions, afternoon sessions. The morning sessions uh, have a break uh, to, to drink coffee and to discuss things. Then after the morning, we, we will have some food outside, just outside here. So you could recover your your strength. And uh, uh, we meet again in the afternoon with a few sessions. And the last session in the afternoon will be a discussion session, which I hope will be very useful to uh, discuss whatever it has been said here. And... Uh, probably initiate new collaborations and things like that. Yes, um, there are some printed programs here, so if you want to to take one, so you you could organize your hours and the, the, the talks that you're interested in, and that will be it, probably. Um, well, I must say that I feel a little bit awkward because, I mean, I've been collaborating with all, all these people who, who are here uh, during the years, and it's the first time they meet all together, right, in, in the same room. So I'm slightly nervous and slightly excited about it. Uh, 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 the announcement is that these uh, talks will be uh, transmitted in vivo, in, by via Zoom, if uh, well, I didn't make the link the Zoom link public just to force people to come here uh, to the auditorium. But anyhow, you uh, it, they will be uh, transmitted uh, uh, in vivo by Zoom, and also they will be recorded and put it in YouTube, so people in Europe in in places where the hours are very awkward to, to listen to the talks in vivo, could actually uh, uh, see them, right? The only disadvantage is that uh, they will, won't be able to ask questions, yes? Well, if you see it in YouTube, but I mean, it, people who are in Zoom uh, uh, could ask questions, so uh, we, we'll listen to that. Um, uh, any questions? Right. If not, uh, we will start with the first keynote uh, talk given by my very good friend, probably my best friend, really, uh, uh, for so many years, uh, uh, be, because we were uh, studying the, the doctorate in physics in Oxford. Uh, in the same room, actually, we were sharing the office for three years, and uh, we became friends for life. And uh, 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 to my luck, he has become one of the greatest exponents of sciences, of science in physics, in his own country, which is Finland. Uh, uh, congratulations! I don't know if you say congratulations because they are now not only a part of Europe, but a part of NATO. Yeah. And uh, 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 Finland is very close to my heart. I've been a joint professor at the University of Helsinki, thanks to Kimo, for 15 years. And uh, we, we collaborated together in many, many topics during, during the years. So, and then when the pandemic... Uh, started, uh, we were obviously in touch, and we decided to model how the pandemic spreads. And for the first time, we wrote a paper together about the pandemics, modeling the spread, geographical spread of the pandemics there in Mexico, in Finland, and in Iceland. Oh, because the other friend, or Oxford friend, is from Iceland, you see. So... Uh, uh, if you want to know who Kimo is, I mean, in the internet, in the page of the Institute, there are some uh, uh, information about that. So you go there and you click there, 
you will see that Kimo has been professor in many, many, many institutions in Finland and outside of Finland. He's been joining in Oxford as well and in Vienna and other places. And uh, now he is the president of the Finnish Academy of Arts and Sciences. Yeah. So we are very proud to have him here. And uh, I hope you enjoy his talk, which is uh, a very awkward uh, topic, which is called social physics, right? What, the, the, what this means that you, you are a physicist and the only thing you know in life is physics, but you apply your physics to other systems which are more complicated than physics itself. And of the complicated systems that you could uh, think of, the most complicated one is social society, human society. Because there are many, well, well, you know, I don't have to explain to you that, but I mean, people think that social behavior is unpredictable. But I mean, I hope Kimo will show us that, no, there's a lot of fun and we could say a lot about the human behavior in, uh, and relations uh, by applying physics to them. So, Kimo, it is a pleasure for me to have you here. And please, tell us. All right. Yeah. Uh. Well, thank you, Rafael, for the introduction. And uh, I don't know whether I'm uh, your best friend, but you are my best friend. So, uh, and it's a really great pleasure to be here. I think the last time I was here for four years ago, a little over four years ago. And, uh, and it's a, uh, Really good to come here back and uh, seeing familiar faces. And uh, I can't say the same thing as Raphael said that I've uh, been working with uh, all the people in the audience, but uh, most most of the people in the audience, I have been had the pleasure to uh, interact with with, and then also write uh, a number of papers, especially. With Raphael and uh, and um, we are sort of uh, uh, kind of brothers. I mean, we are the forming members of the Oxford Gang. There is the th a third member of the Oxford Gang is the uh, Icelander, and that was uh, good to write a joint paper with a chemist and. Uh, to physicists and, uh, and 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 so on. So uh, Raphael mentioned that I'm uh, my talk is uh, about the awkward topic. Uh, I know that a uh, number of years uh, uh, when we wrote together, I was trying to push this um, uh, terminology, social physics, uh, but Raphael vehemently uh, opposed to that. But I. Uh, Perhaps because of my severance, uh, uh, he has now turned to accept at least uh, this uh, topic uh, uh, as being one of the uh, physics uh, where physics can uh, give uh, give some insight. What is what is going on? Okay. Um, so the title is Social Physics Data-Driven Studies of Human Social um, Connectome. Connectome is an other word for network, basically. So overview of my uh, presentation will be will consist of a kind of uh, what is social physics, uh, basically how I do see it. In my view, it is the quest to understand social phenomena using physical uh, physical approaches and data, which there is a plenty available at the moment. 
<clears throat> then I go deeper, uh, demonstrating that uh, indeed it works works to enhance our, understa our, our understanding using the mobile phone data and uh, and uh, and looking at the mobile phone based uh, social networks and analyze that first of all with different methodologies and then uh, having analyzed uh, trying to build models to understand deeper what is going on understand the dynamics which is the uh, one of the main titles of this um, symposium Then I go to uh, even deeper than that, uh, uh, talk about eco-centric sociality or social behavior from the individual point of view. And then uh, look at the sex differences in intimate relationships, which is, of course, uh, always interest uh, of our, ourselves all the time, I would think. Then uh, after that, uh, uh, look at uh, uh, the circadian rhythms in social networks and uh, talk a little bit about the chronotypes as well. So uh, these are indeed very complex uh, issues uh, we are touching. And uh, uh, to me, uh, one perhaps one of the most uh, complex uh, issues and uh, Looking at the scales of different complexities, of human complexities, there are, of course, the biological um, uh, scale uh, uh, where uh, nowadays in the, in the bioinformatics and uh, in the systems biology, you look at the gene level thing and protein level thing and uh, so you can ask there yeah, whether the complexity is in the number of uh, uh, genes, for example. Here I have a list of different uh, um, kind of coding genes in different uh, uh, species. There is the uh, fruit fly, which seems to have a, a little less than uh, 14,000 coding genes, coding proteins, and so on. C. elegans, this worm-like uh, creature, uh, has already 19,500. And uh, human beings uh, having a uh, little over 23,000. It's, it's a rather small, and small amount. And there are some plants which have even more. I mean, like this uh, mustard uh, family plant, Arab Arabidopsis, uh, have 27,000. So you're asking whether the complexity is in the number, but it's not. It is in the, in the connectivities of different issues. I mean, in the network, uh, how things correlate with each other or are uh, dependent upon each other. Of course, uh, you go in the individual higher level, you go to the psychological or cognitive level, looking at the brains of individuals, there's even more, I mean, there's a, uh, neurons, a uh, lot of neurons, but it's not the number there either. It is the number of connectivities between the neurons which matter. And uh, my focus here is the social and societal phenomena. People are networked, they are in relation to each, each other. A number of... Uh, uh, Psychologists have asked, uh, uh, what makes us, us humans uniquely, uniquely human? And their answer is that it is our storytelling capability, language-based sociality. It's about communication. So storytelling is that we are, uh, I mean, Religion is a one way of storytelling and uh, kind of believes our storytelling as well, which, which uh, is communicating uh, from the past to the, to the future uh, uh, things. So it is uh, in the communication and exchange of social and cultural resources in a network. What makes us um, uniquely human? Of course, some animals have networks as well. They have these communities, and uh, but uh, 
they don't have that clear way of communicating. So the complex, we are interested anyway in these social matters and in all the other matters as well, uh, uh, would be the complexity in structure, function, and how that system responds to external, external triggering forces. Well, social physics, as I said, it's a quest to understand social phenomena. You might wonder whether this is a new thing, but it is not, actually. French philosopher Auguste Comte, already 1826, term, uh, used the term social physics, saying that it is that science which occupies itself with social phenomena considered in the same light as astronomical, physical, chemical, and psychological phenomena. That is to say, as being subject to natural and invariable laws. Of course, that is a rather tall order, but that understandable on the basis that it was uh, right in the sort of time of industrial revolution when the worldview of people was mostly mechanistic. Then there is in the, uh, some, uh, uh, well, less, less than 10 years, there was uh, uh, Alex and Sandy Pentland uh, from MIT who wrote this book, uh, uh, Social Physics. I mean, kind of uh, having a renaissance of uh, this terminology. Uh, about uh, August Comte, uh, he's considered the uh, uh, father of sociology. So after a few years, the term social physics was uh, uh, moved uh, or uh, transferred to sociology. So Bentland uh, uh, had been studying at MIT using a lot of data and uh, trying to understand human behavior on the basis of that. And then there was a proliferation of uh, some uh, other books uh, by um, by Abhika Sakrapati. I mean, uh, he called it sociophysics. And then also Serge uh, 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 Galam uh, uh, from France, uh, sociophysics. Then uh, uh, Geoffrey West, uh, who was the former uh, head of the Santa Fe Institute uh, wrote this book uh, some six years ago uh, called Scale. And he was uh, more careful in terming uh, uh, what uh, this business is all about. He said that the underlying laws uh, of complex social systems are not known yet. But they show regularity, so there must be some governing principles. So this triggered him and a number of other scientists to start looking at this, uh, this phenomena with, uh, with the means they have, uh, with the tools and, uh, and with all kinds of, um, different approaches jointly with, uh, with, uh, uh, sociologist and uh, psychologist. Of course, it took some time to get the eyes broken and uh, and uh, start working together. We also wrote with uh, Kunal Patacharya this uh, uh, review in the uh, Advances in Physics X, which is an uh, open access uh, uh, journal of Advances in Physics. Uh, this uh, review, what we think about. Uh, what is social physics from our point of view? So let's uh, let's go uh, deeper in these social phenomena, and there are, there are these phenomena happening in different uh, ways. You can uh, focus on the on the structural phenomena, looking at the friendships, kinships, and uh, things of that sort. Looking at the groups and communities, uh, community structures, and then uh, whole society structures as well. But then you are interested in uh, in the dynamics. I mean, the uh, social interaction itself is a dynamic uh, uh, event. I mean, making a phone call from one person to another one. 
for example, and then dynamics of groups, uh, uh, group formation, uh, or dynamics in in networks like rumor spreading or things of that sort. So the question is, quest is to understand how does these microscopics translate to macroscopics, which is basically also in the in the physics what we are uh, what we are mostly doing. There are these uh, so different sociologist perspectives. Uh, there is this uh, uh, Mark Franovetters. Uh, um, uh, a kind of um, uh, connectivity structure perspective of uh, connectivity structure of a society perspective. He wrote this uh, canonical paper, a strength of weak ties hypothesis, uh, saying that the stronger the tie between A and B, the larger the proportion of individuals S to whom both are tied. So if I we are good friends uh, with Raphael, but I mean, we are sharing friends, which is making us even better friends. So the consequences on that is uh, on the global scale structure. Society consists of strongly connected communities linked by weak ties, which holds uh, the society together. Then there's another kind of ecocentric perspective by Robin Dunbar from Oxford. Uh, ecocentric social network consists of layers of different uh, um, emotional closeness. Because, I mean, the uh, social behavior is in terms of social closeness, emotional closeness. And he has this uh, 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 canonical sentence, the total number of active uh, human relations does not exceed 150. Well, this 150 is not an accurate number. In this case, it's a, 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 of the order, number of order, so to speak. It's is called Dunbar number. So it has an expon uh, ex evolutionary explanation. There is a cognitive limit to the number of people any person can maintain stable relationships. This is called social brain hypothesis. And uh, there has been a few years ago a claim that uh, uh, in Twitter friends or Facebook friends, I mean, uh, people can have uh, uh, in thousands of them. But uh, uh, I hold, uh, and as Robin does as well, that uh, these are not real laws social connections you you deal with uh, uh, closely. Okay, in the digital world, uh, things are uh, <clears throat> uh, somewhat different. I mean, there are different degrees. And there is a study by Dunbar asking how just how good is the is the digital world in this social in the sociality or social um, promotions point of view. So we made a study comparing face-to-face -face, uh, contact with people and then uh, Skype or similar similar video uh, uh, and linkages and then the phone uh, using just the voice call and then the uh, is instant messaging, IM, and text messaging, and email, and uh, social network services, and found that the people are anyway happiest to use the face-to-face. -face. And uh, then the Skype, uh, Skype, and the video contacts come come close to that. But then the phone, uh, phone is also better than these uh, these other, and the reason for that is, of course, that it is a real time event. When you call to somebody, it's a real-time event, and then then you can feel uh, closer when you hear the voice. Well, I, I put this uh, uh, advertisement of Finland being the, uh, in the se uh, sixth time in a row uh, named to be the happiest country uh, in the world, and uh, then there are, in this picture, there are two Happy formula, uh, uh, finished formula one drivers 
I don't know whether you can guess, but I mean, uh, the man in the middle is uh, 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 Kimi Raikkonen, and then uh, the, on the on the left is Valtteri uh, uh, Bottas, and then there is a, a, a German guy, Sebastian Vettel, on the on the on the right. So they have just one, and then. Uh, the, the two guys, the Finnish guys, they show their happiness in the, in the winning, uh, just uh, uh, showing the thumb in the uh, in the middle, and then the other one just, but being, still being straight faced. I mean, nothing, no, no smile at all. Like the, unlike the, the veto is smiling. So, well. Okay, so um, so indeed uh, we we need this kind of face-to-face uh, -face light contacts in in our our behavior. Okay, let's go deeper in in doing studies and then um, talk about the computational data-driven approach to social phenomena. Nowadays we have uh, I mean mounting uh, digital databases. Uh, for big, big, big data. And we have the uh, high performance computing to do the uh, analysis of this uh, data analy analytics of this uh, data. We have the network and complex system science and the social science. And the combination of them uh, is called in many terms. Social physics is one of them, one of them which I call, which I use. Also, computational social sciences use social informatics. Data-driven social sciences, science uh, is uh, one of those terms which is used. So the idea there is that you have data and you want to understand the structure, function, and, uh, and the response, how the system responds. I mean, the social system responds to an externally triggering uh, uh, forces or events. And the methodologies is to analyze that data, first of all. Once you had understood something in terms of the analysis, um, mostly it relates to the structure, but also it could relate to the, uh, to the, uh, to the function of the system. Then you start building, building some modeling or models of, of that in order to understand the functions and also the response of the of the system. And then uh, if you are, have uh, been able to verify that this has, these models have some relevance indeed, then, uh, then you would like to do simulations or kind of predictive, predictive approaches by, uh, by using these models to simulate what, what goes on. So that all that chain I call social physics. It's like one is one is using in, in physics anyway. Okay, um, these computational approaches uh, nowadays what can what one can use are are plenty. They are indeed plenty, and uh, uh, some people call it uh, uh, comp uh, data science. I call it computational science. Um, because for me, computational science means that uh, you want to understand what, how it ticks, not just analyzing the data, which the data science is mostly about. So you can uh, 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 divide that to a kind of explorative uh, 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 research or hypothesis-based research. Usually the social, studying social phenomena is based on some kind of hypothesis-based uh, uh, things which you want to uh, verify or corroborate in some way. Uh, but uh, then uh, from physics, you are uh, doing more kind of uh, explorative way. And then I call this physics approach. You will look at uh, uh, this thing from the network science point of view. You do data mining, or uh, nowadays people uh, want to call it because it's a real uh, social phenomena, reality mining. 
and uh, then you do this agent-based modeling uh, modeling as well. And on the data science side, you have this artificial uh, intelligence approaches, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. And then in the middle, that is basic, those are basic kind of statistical uh, 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 approaches. Like, the, like today's uh, people are uh, a lot of uh, talking about this chat GPT. I mean, it's a, it's a statistical approach to things. I mean, feed in a lot of data and then it learns something from that, but it, uh, it's not in that sense a truly explorative approach. Okay, now let's go to the business, real business. And, uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, had this uh, mobile phone data at our disposal, which the digitalization and uh, ICT has uh, created. They can be considered because people are using their mobile phones to uh, communicate with each other. They can be considered as uh, digital footprints. Uh, uh, of their, uh, of their, uh, 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 social, social behavior and, uh, uh, social phenomena altogether. We had this data some, uh, well, 16, uh, 17 years ago already. And, uh, 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 uh a large data set from a European country. And, uh, and for, I think it was then for three months, all the calls within one one mobile phone service operator, and then uh, we wanted to look at uh, the social behavior. Of course, uh, we can look at it from the point of view how much people call to each other, kind of aggregate uh, number of aggregate uh, uh, number of minutes or seconds or whatever uh, uh, time measures uh, they spend together. And we requested that uh, that uh, this has to be truly social. That if I, uh, it's a social uh, act. If I call uh, Raphael and he calls me back, but if somebody is trying to sell you something, I mean, it's, it is basically one way. There is no social contact. So uh, then you uh, count the aggregate number of minutes or aggregate number of calls. And that tells you how strong the social link indeed is. So if I, uh, within a certain time period, call a uh, number of times or number of minutes, then, then, then uh, that link is, uh, link is uh, socially stronger than if uh, I would be calling just a uh, 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 few times. Okay, so then uh, we get uh, this kind of weighted social network, which uh, tells uh, how close the contact contact between in two individuals are. So using that, we created the network, which you can see here on the on the uh, left, and then uh, focusing and uh, zooming in, you can see structure. I mean, it's not just a kind of random uh, snowball-like structure, but you can see the structure. You can see closely connected communities. Here, are, there are circles over there. I don't know whether it sees uh, clearly, but I mean, there are circles, they are closely connected uh, communities. And those closely connected communities are weakly connected to each other. So in the in the uh, society, the weak connections actually are important from the point of view that uh, they hold the society together. It has to be there; otherwise, it would be separating different uh, society, smaller societies. So then uh, we wanted to test whether this hypothesis by Granovetter the uh, strength of the weak ties hypothesis is, is, is indeed correct. And indeed, uh, we calculated the overlap of, uh, overlap of friendships between two individuals. So here, uh, uh, the first one over here, 
They don't, they only a link between them. They don't share any, any French. Here they say, share some. Here there's a full sharing. So that, looking at that uh, as a function of the tie strength between these two individuals, you see that the uh, uh, neighborhood overlap increases. So that verifies in the large scale. What is point. Yeah, I have a point. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. In the large scale, that uh, indeed uh, the Granovetter hypothesis is correct in these large communities. Okay, the other, th other thing is that we did this, what physicists usually do, this kind of percolation analysis as well. Having uh, this kind of network. And uh, uh, then uh, well, some people call it thresholding analysis, starting to cut bonds in different ways. One way is in the descending order from the uh, cutting from the um, uh, 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 strongest link first going towards the weaker link. So when 80% uh, 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 is cut of those points, then you can still see 20% uh, of the weakest thing remaining there. You can still see that there is a connectivity. There's a kind of backbone connectivity between individuals. But if you do it the other way around, cut uh, uh, from the weaker link, weaker links, then uh, having cut 80% of the links, then it disintegrates. So indeed, you see that the role of weak and strong ties is different. Okay, I can, I can use this one. So uh, then we did this, uh, um, having this structure now, with this, this kind of um, uh, reading, reading simulation, the simple spreading simulation, susceptible, and infected SI model. And we infected a node in that system, in the, that real system, by piece of information. And let's call it a, a rumor. And start uh, 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 looking how the uh, information spreads through the, through the uh, network. Also, empirically, we uh, claimed that hopping from one node or from one individual to another one depends upon the strength of that tie. And as a reference, we said that, okay, it is just a structure. All the ties are equal, of equal strength. So just as a compar comparison. So as in the reference case, you see that the, uh, uh, average of 1,000 runs, and uh, you see that uh, the thing spreads very quickly uh, throughout the whole network. But in the empirical case, it is much lower. And indeed, uh, looking at the single run there, you see where it hops very fast, because it has many routes, as, uh, as uh, shown here, to, to go through that. Uh, from that node to another one. But in this case, it has only uh, one link, and maybe if that link is uh, weak, then it takes time. It uh, sort of gets hooked, hooked to that uh, node, and then after a while, can, can, can go through. So this is indeed a kind of, it has these plateaus, so on. Um, here's a kind of simulation of, I think, 500 nodes, and here's the real um, red, and uh, using the uh, proper time scale, uh, we could see that uh, it sort of uh, goes through uh, the whole network in, in four days. I was giving this talk, uh, talk in, um, in India 
um, some years ago. And then one professor raised his hand to say, interrupted me and said, that in India, it happens in four seconds. Uh, of course, it happens in four seconds nowadays uh, because we have all the other social media uh, to use, uh, use to spread the information. But this is only based on the people picking up the phone and calling to some other. So that's the difference here. Yes, okay. So there is an information spreading speed, letter-based, uh, is less than mobile phone-based, it's less than social media-based or bot-based. Okay. Now, let's go to the modeling part. Well, I have asked in the beginning, uh, can modeling illuminate sociological questions? How parsimonious uh, can these uh, models be? How kind of simple? How can these models be validated? Okay. There was a nice book uh, I read some years ago by Boyd and Richardson, Mathematical Models of Social Evolution. And they had picked up from uh, Lewis Carroll's a book, Sylvia and Bruno Concluded, which Carroll was, was an uh, Oxford mathematician who uh, wrote this Alice in the Wonderland and a uh, number of other, other uh, books. Well, quite interesting books indeed. And indeed, there was a phrase, what do you consider the largest map that would be really useful? Somebody said about six inches to the mile. Only six inches, exclaimed my hair. We very soon got six yards to the mile. Then we tried hundred yards to the mile. And then came the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. Have you used it much? I inquired. It has never been spread out yet, said my hair. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So now we use the country itself as its own map. And I assure you, it does nearly as well. So this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, so the answer there, I believe that we can uh, illuminate some questions, sociological questions. Uh, I, I believe that it can be quite parsimonious. And I believe that it can be validated by comparing the modeling results with the, with the reality. But then about modeling, let me quote a great uh, physicist and a, a mathematician. So the, uh, uh, so Isaac Newton, Newton said, truth is ever to be found in the simplicity and not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. And of course, it's uh, uh, Albert Einstein's uh, great phrase, great phrase, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And then uh, this uh, uh, statistician, uh, George Box said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So there's two, two camps, uh, so to speak. Okay, so we wanted to uh, uh, create this uh, weighted social network model, taking an agent-based approach uh, to network formation and modeling how people get acquaintances with local and global search mechanisms. And we had a fixed size network of nodes, individuals, internal structure changes, uh, claiming that internal structure changes uh, uh, faster than changes in the size of the network. And then in, in the network itself is subject to uh, 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 some dynamics. There's a local weighted search for uh, new acquaintances and reinforcement of often used links, which is called cyclic. 
closure and there's a, a global search by creation of a random links which is called focal closure which is would be described as uh, 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 people going to the same uh, same clubs and uh, and uh, becoming acquainted and uh, or having similar hobbies and uh, so on and then uh, we had also uh, uh, random removal of notes uh, uh, it could have been also removal of links, but I mean, we used the notes that uh, and people jumped, for example, to another other service provider. So what was not in the visibility of this uh, network we wanted to create. There was this uh, uh, studies made uh, made uh, by Bosnet and Watts in Science 2006, and uh, they had... Uh, looks at these uh, different uh, uh, social phenomena formation mechanisms uh, in using the data from uh, from some schools, how people form uh, 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 friendships and, and, and so on. And they found that the uh, cycle closer, the uh, larger the cycle is, uh, is uh, 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 going uh, slower, I mean, going uh, down, so to speak, the focal closure doesn't really uh, go down because it's um, it's uh, it's uh, um, it's basically uh, sharing sharing friends uh, through hobbies, for example. So we had this uh, uh, published this uh, paper in Fish Web Letter uh, a year after that. And we had this uh, local attachment mechanism, which we could, could call, uh, which we call a cyclic or triadic closure mechanism, where there's a strengthening of the of the links the more you use the link. And then there's a global uh, attachment, which is a focal closure, which is a random event. And then we had the no deletion uh, process. So. Uh, this uh, uh, is a, a kind of simulation of it. What uh, what tends to happen? So these uh, um, uh, connectivities are, are formed, and you can see uh, communities starting to form, them being still connected uh, to each other uh, by weaker links, and 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 uh, so on. So, in the interest of time, let me just. Uh, uh, Summarize the result uh, that uh, uh, the way that local search, the cycle closure mechanism, and global search must denote deletion and the link reinforcement. When you use the link more and more, then it enforces the link and uh, make it more, I mean, more weight or stronger. So that's the kind of um, parameter which we have used. Uh, if we don't have any kind of link in, re in reinforcement mechanism, this uh, structure is showing more kind of uh, what we call snow snowball structure, rather random structure. But if you start uh, um, having this link reinforcement, then you start seeing communities forming and even if you increase that, you will really uh, see uh, communities with dense and strong internal and sparse and weak external connections. Then we also analyzed uh, uh, that whether it has the chronovetarian properties. And indeed, what we could see is that the weak, weak ties hypothesis by chronovetter is reproduced in this model. And then also looking at the, uh, when we had in this uh, ascending link removal or descending link removal, having a, a similar kind of behavior that there was a kind of uh, using this term so, uh, susceptibility, we could see a pink. So a kind of phase, phase change or phase transition in statistical, known in statistical phenomena, uh, uh, critical phenomena, indeed. So, uh, 
at least we could say that this simple model could serve as a kind of plausible model to describe what happens when a social uh, uh, network forms. Quite simple model indeed. Okay, we then extended uh, the model with having these uh, multi-layer structures uh, and then uh, uh, modeling the relationship fading or breakup of relationships and then uh, kind of sampling uh, idea and published number of papers. I don't go deeper into that. Uh, and then um, uh, use this multi-layer model and there we also had a simulation, so two-layer model, which, uh, uh, okay, let me just, uh, so there are two layers, I mean, showing alternating uh, uh, two layers, how the, how the thing tends to form. It has some, has some structures, but I mean, uh, there's a tendency to destroy this one chronometarian structure anyway when there are more layers involved. Okay, let me now move to the ecocentric perspective of human sociality. There are uh, phenomena which has got homophily a strong tendency for individuals to associate with others whom they perceive as being similar to themselves in some way. Then there's assortative mixing by degree uh, in social networks. I mean, uh, highly connected uh, uh, nodes are uh, uh, connected to other highly connected nodes. There is that kind of tendency. Then there's a disortative mixing by genders in a network of sexual contacts. And, and so on. And this, uh, Granovetarian, and uh, this, uh, Danvarian, um, ecocentric perspective, uh, to look at the social phenomena is indeed these, uh, different layer structures. There's the uh, strongest layer is the support click, and then the sympathy group, and then the band, and then clan, which is the kind of limit of the, of the Dunbar number. And then there are even larger mega band and tribe. And so on, but anyway, uh, 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 this uh, this uh, structure book, uh, these innermost links are more emotionally close, close links to each other. Okay, and then uh, see. So we had uh, even more data to look at these issues. Uh, we had something like uh, uh, three plus years of data. Uh, which in, involved 10, uh, 10 million service subscribers, uh, 10 billion calls altogether over that three plus years, 1 billion text messages. In addition, we uh, took out uh, demographic data from that country, which is freely available, of course, because countries used to have the statistics uh, offices and then they collect all kinds of information. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, from that uh, uh, service provider, uh, we had this um, um, these information, gender of the subscriber, age of the subscriber, postcode of the subscriber, and most used tower position, location of the most used tower position uh, of that data. I, I, I don't go later to that uh, uh, statistics offices uh, data. This data I call is from prehistoric time for the reason that it is prior to uh, smartphones, it's 2007 to 2010, so the smartphones were not used that that much yet, and 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 uh, and um, and it was before uh, real uh, SNS uh, like Facebook or Twitter boom, so it is more kind of condensed to the uh, closer social uh, uh, relations. So there we uh, looked at the degree of friendships. And since we knew, knew the gender, so we had this uh, uh, frequency of contact uh, between uh, an ego who makes the call and author 
who receives the call. So and we we mark them uh, uh, that the male is uh, uh, plus one, uh, female is minus one. It could be the other way around, and uh, color them uh, 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 stereotypically uh, blue and uh, red, and so on. And uh, uh, calculated the average gender of the best friend. So looking as a function of age, age, then you can see that uh, um, that. Uh, um, uh, uh, best friend uh, uh, for a male ego tends to be female, and it, it goes fast, fast in the early years. Which it starts for around uh, eighteen, the full age, so to speak, and then goes uh, and peaking, peaking uh, around uh, around thirty or so. And vice versa for the female, the best friend seems to be uh, based on this calling frequency, seems to be male. And it stays longer uh, at high level and then starts to go down and then changes even. The second best friend is usually of the same sex, at least in the early, early life. So the men and women between 18 and 45 have best friends of the opposite sex and the second best friends are generally of the same sex. And women are more focused on uh, on opposite sex relationships than men. I mean, they they stay longer at high level there. Yeah. Okay, then um, age distribution of the best friends uh, through the life course. So here we picked up on the on the on the right uh, ego on the left uh, ego male twenty five years old and the ego female twenty five years old on the on the left on the right uh, and then uh, see that uh, they are more or less at the same age. They're usually some age difference of two to three years in favor of uh, men being older. Then if you go to 50-year-old uh, uh, male ego and 50-year-old uh, uh, female ego, then you see that uh, others come into the picture. Their, their, um, uh, their children uh, are, 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 are coming to the picture and, uh, and, uh, and uh, for the male, still, still the, uh, uh, Supposed to be uh, a partner uh, is the, is the strongest contact, but then come come also the children. In the in the fifty year old female, um, in the are more or so the same level, the children and the and the partner. But then if you go even further, okay, let me see, yeah. I mean, 60 year old uh, uh, male ego and 60 year old female ego. Then uh, for the male, uh, 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 it, it so happens that uh, the, uh, the uh, partner is, to, uh, is equally strong as the, as the supposed to be daughter, watching after the daughter, perhaps. Than more than uh, uh, the, the the son, but for the female, uh, it seems that uh, 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 the children are much more important than say, and uh, especially the the daughter is more. Uh, uh, and this uh, poor male partner, should I say, uh, is only uh, playing the third fiddle in this game. Okay, and um, here is a sample of, of, of the network. Here is a basically um, a couple. I wanted to show 50-year-old uh, female coupled with a uh, 56-year-old uh, male. And this is the number of calls within a certain period of time. They have called to each other. Here you can see that, uh, um, that uh, mother... Um, Supposed to be mother is calling uh, to the daughter much more than the, the, the there is a linkage, stronger linkage between them. 
and also uh, quite strong links to the to the supposed to be sun. This is interesting. Uh, interesting couple formation. Uh, they have a, a huge number of calls between themselves. And we know from the data that they live uh, uh, 800 kilometers apart to each other. And we know also that they don't call to each other during the weekends. So we know from that that they must be traveling between these two places. And they don't need to call when they are together. Okay, here is the, uh, uh, that there's an certainly asymmetry in the, in the, in the calls that, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, okay. Uh, sorry? It's weekly or daily or? Uh, during the weekdays, we, we saw them calling and then during the weekend stay. How do you measure this number of calls Is it per week or per? Uh, I, I think it must be more uh, uh, in, in terms of months. I don't recall exactly, but it is. Uh, it is. Uh, I think it is uh, actually that data we had for seven months. So it is for the seven months period. All the aggregate call between those individuals. Yeah, and here you can see uh, see that uh, uh, that for example this. Uh, uh, Supposed to be mother is calling a daughter quite quite a lot, certainly twice as much as to the supposed to be husband or partner, and then also to the uh, to the son more, and the son is calling uh, less back, but also this uh, uh, younger lady is calling uh, who's supposed to be mother more. Okay, yeah. All right, so let's move on. And there's, a, uh, I, I jump uh, into this. So there's an imbalance between the scoring. Let me just quickly go through the, the circadian rhythm. Uh, this is an interesting phenomena, uh, is that um, internal biological clock is known for quite a, quite a number of years already, a French, uh, 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 I think astro astronomer uh, uh, de Maran um, had an experiment, placed this mimosa plant. Um, uh, I noticed first of all that during the daytime, the mimosa plant uh, 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 opens its leaves, quite open. And then uh, when it uh, comes night, it cramps to leave. Then he had an idea to put the mimosa plant in total darkness. So when it was supposed to be daylight, it opened its leaves, although it was dark. And when it was supposed to be uh, uh, night, it was again cramped. So it, the plant had a, had a, uh, had a uh, internal clock. Of course, there was a Nobel Prize given in medicine and uh, physiology uh, to these three gentlemen who uh, uh, found the molecular mechanism, uh, uh, regulation mechanism involving three different uh, 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 RNAs, which is regulating and uh, sort of, uh, they were looking at this uh, fruit fly and, uh, and uh, then uh, finding out that uh, this internal clock is uh, regulated by these uh, by these genes uh, regulating regulating the protein production and and so on and making the twenty four uh, roughly twenty four hour circadian rhythm being an interplay between these three genes. So this is like. Uh, I have a background in electrical engineering. This is like a, a, a feedback mechanism uh, system, which we one, one knows that this kind of system can, uh, with the negative feedback, it can be made, made to be oscillating. So, I mean, the question is, are we like truth lies? 
and uh, and do season and so so socially driven uh, factors play a role. To what extent uh, is daily behavior of people in urban environment still influenced by seasonal changes of daily light? During the social time where urban people live in, do the environmental factors like the sunrise, sunset, length of the daylight, and the ambient temperature influence the timing the daily activities are performed? Do socially driven activities of people living in different places but inside the same time zone onset to term onset and terminate their activities at the same time? Okay, we had this uh, uh, additional data, seasonal record, temperature record, geophysical record, sunrise, sunset, daylight duration, and so on, country statistics in city populations and distribution of population in, 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 in cities and uh, rural areas as well. So we could see this kind of uh, 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 circassimidian or semicircadian behavior. There are two peaks activity peaks uh, in the mobile phone usage and in between there's a uh, there's a uh, kind of resting some kind of resting time in the afternoon which you could call it uh, a siesta for example and then uh, during the night time uh, uh, there is no no activity at all as there so people are supposed to sleep anyway so uh, we analyzed that uh, data in order to uh, see uh, how long uh, resting time or sleep time they have during the night. This is uh, just uh, showing the analysis of two different days. This is, uh, I think, mid mid uh, 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 mid February of the year, and this is somewhere uh, sometime early early August of the year. So there's a different amount of um, uh, uh, sunlight. So what uh, we we see from here is that um, that basically uh, our finding is that uh, um, the nighttime uh, behavior or activity in the summer is roughly one hour less than the, in the winter time. Are you starting to clap soon? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm uh, 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 in my jet lag time. Okay, then uh, we were uh, 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 looking the resting pattern in different uh, days, and uh, here you can see that the kind of true resting pattern people are looking at is the sun, uh, Sunday resting pattern. And indeed, you see a dip, a dip down uh, in, the, in the summer. Less, less so in the, in the, during the weekdays. And then we look at the temperature effect. And indeed, we saw that uh, in the day, daily uh, resting time, that siesta time, uh, uh, the people have longer siestas uh, in the in the in the summer. So then, if you count these two resting times together, the nighttime sleep and the daily or afternoon resting time, basically what you uh, see more or less is a is a is a constant throughout the year. What else? Also, let me do this, and this is the last thing I show. So uh, we also look at, uh, at the same latitude in that country, uh, uh, two different uh, cities, and seeing whether that uh, country is 10.7 degree in longitudinal degrees. And one, uh, one hour, uh, our zone is one hour zone is uh, 15 degrees. Okay, so it's uh, little less than one, one time zone, uh, that country uh, measured from the westernmost city uh, to the easternmost city. And what we saw that uh, 
that uh, I think we picked up also a number of cities on that same latitude. But we saw that uh, um, indeed that um, if you look at the uh, um, westernmost city, it starts its day, daily activities one hour or I mean, 43 minutes later than the easternmost city of that country, which is roughly speaking that um, proportion of the uh, one time zone, I mean, 10.7 out of, uh, I mean, over, over 15 is about 43 minutes. So people indeed uh, are synchronized to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, sun, sun progression through the sky, even in the winter. So this is a summary of the thing. So I skip. There's a, I would love to look at the data in China. Because before, before the revolution, China consisted of five time zones, which is roughly between 75 uh, longitudinal degrees. But after the revolution, it was in, 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 in one time zone, in Beijing time. So I would like, uh, like to see how people behave or how they are synchronized uh, in that country being forced to one, one time zone. Okay, I skip this and then skip this one and then um, end with this that um, the uh, social physics, I hope to have convinced you that the social physics is the quest to understand underlying governing principles of human social behavior giving insight to the structure, function, and response through the analysis, modeling, and hopefully simulation or predicting as well. So you can ask what next? There's this uh, Asimov's uh, foundation series. Uh, there's uh, this guy, Harry Seldon, who is a mathematician and psychologist, developed a psychohistory a new field of science and psychology that equates all possibilities in large societies to mathematics, allowing for the prediction of the future events. Well, we are not there yet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, somebody wants to ask any questions? Well, thank you, Kimo, so much. I have enjoyed your talk, uh, you always. Um, let me ask you about your future plans, because I would like to see the same sort of analysis in WhatsApp. Because communication has changed completely. You can talk in a chat to a group of people, which makes a huge difference. And you can follow your children, which all mothers do, in a very different way. So uh, I, I wonder if you are planning to do that. In, you you talk us about prehistory. I'm asking you if you are planning to do history right now. And something else about the networks and the human behavior. There is all this discussion about how Homo sapiens uh, survive to the other groups. Oh, and it has to do with collaboration. It's hard to believe because we don't seem to yeah, collaborate yeah. very much. But I think that that could be seen in the networks as well. If you have addressed this this uh, question, thank you. Yeah, well, uh, I think I mean uh, we have uh, mostly concentrated on this what we call uh, 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 social phenomena. Of course, what you said about chat—that's a real time. Thing and it is it is definitely more social than than for example sending emails or using other uh, social network uh, services. Um, uh, should I have that data? I would definitely be interested in to, in to look at that. 
But nowadays, the data is, is the, uh, I mean, they say it's the new oil and, uh, I mean, who is the holder of the data? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a master and whatever. A anyway, uh, uh, but yet I would like to say that there's, I have just scratched the surface using this mobile phone data. It is still a gold mine. I, I want to continue with that plus adding, adding some other, other uh, kind of communication modalities as they are called to look at. And then uh, in a combination of that, you could uh, get even, even deeper. And what is the social contact uh, nowadays more? What was the other, other uh, homo sapiens? Uh, yeah, I mean, I fully agree with you that uh, uh, there are these uh, features in our behavior uh, that uh, uh, you can you can touch. We have touched this altruism or uh, this kind of uh, telling the truth or I mean, making these uh, lies or uh, uh, pro-social or uh, anti-social uh, deception uh, things. And there are, there are a number of other, other things uh, you can add, especially to the modeling, although you don't have the data, but it is an interesting exercise to see how that uh, that would uh, would go. Okay. Yeah, this, the data in Twitter was for free. I mean, in fact, Alberto is going to talk about that. It's good because I mean it has changed because of Elon Musk. And then, if you want data, they do have to pay for it, uh, huge amounts for a very small time. Yeah. And actually, nature appear note that these restrictions have affected the academic endeavor uh, a lot in recent times. I mean, scientists are complaining about that because they don't want to pay, basically. Right. Oh, thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned that one of the quests of social physics would be to link the microscopic properties and processes to the microscopic, uh, mm. microscopic structure of the networks. Um, and you clearly showed with your models that uh, microscopic processes like focal closure and triadic closure and noise deletion can lead to microscopic uh, properties that are similar to the real world. Yeah. But then you showed us the Dombarian uh, perspective and the egocentric networks. And I don't know whether there is a micro and macro link there, whether we have learned something about how microscopic processes lead to microscopic processes in that perspective of the Dombarian and egocentric networks. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. I, I haven't been thinking of that, but of course you are right that uh, uh, we would need to go deeper and deeper in, into that. And uh, uh, my research in these matters has always been such that I'm okay, I'm the physicist. Uh, I have the tools to attack. But then I, I want to have the sociologist and psychologist uh, 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 in, my, uh, in my research group, so the larger uh, research group with whom I collaborate. And uh, and uh, they are asking the questions like you are asking. I mean, uh, okay. Then we have to think about how could we attack, having that data, how we could attack that, uh, 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 that, that question. And uh, sorry, I don't have a straightforward answer to that, but I mean, uh, uh, I think this is a, Right, right direction to go, indeed, and uh, fully agree. Because for me, the Dunbar number is just a constraint. Yeah, there's some limit to our psychological abilities to maintain yeah. a certain number of social relationships, and that's fully compatible with the Granovetarian perspective. Yeah, it's just a constraint on yeah. how much attention we can pay to others. Um, uh, yeah, well. Um, 
the chronolitarian, uh, the uh, Dunbarian uh, egocentric uh, uh, thing is based on the uh, on the uh, social brain hypothesis, which is going deeper into into that. And uh, with Dunbar, we have been considering indeed going deeper into that and looking at more on the basis of this data. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you. I mean, thank you for your your question. And I think he will answer that because in the afternoon, at the end, we will have a discussion section. So please bring these uh, things into light during that time because otherwise people won't have coffee. <laughs> there is a coffee break, please. Bueno, gracias por volver, ¿no? A pesar de todo. Este, no, estoy bromeando, pero... Eh, bueno, vamos a dar un cambio, no de tema, porque se trata también de redes, ¿no? Pero, pues, de personaje, ¿no? Eh, anteriormente tuvimos un personaje ya consolidado y... Y con fama internacional y todo. Y ahora tenemos a Alberto García, que es mi estudiante, que es, obtuvo su maestría el semestre pasado. Y no quiero que aplaudan, pero su tesis ganó el premio de la mejor tesis de maestría en física. ¿Eh? Oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I, I was saying that uh, next speaker is Alberto García. Uh, and um, he obtained he, uh, the prize for the best master thesis in physics last year. Uh, and his thesis was about examining uh, and modeling the communication in Twitter and, uh, and other things. I mean, he will tell you better than me what it's all about. So please, okay, Alberto. It's all yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, I'm top uh, of uh, two projects. Um, the first is uh, the project for my master thesis. And the second uh, was originally the the first uh the first uh approach for my for my thesis so okay um for my thesis uh we study uh the data of, of twitter and and i i'll give you a, a brief description about how how works uh twitter so the profile of one user uh, has a display name and a screen name. Uh, the screen name is like uh, ID. And we have a profile summary, uh, allocation. Uh, after, the, after the Cambridge Analytica, the allocation was um, insert uh, um uh, noisy for for not uh get the exactly location um uh we have uh the users that you following and the users that follow you uh twitter is uh uh works like a direct uh, network um and we have uh, friends, we have followers, and uh, we can uh, mention uh, any users in a, in a tweet. A tweet is like a post. Uh, and when you mention uh, a specific user, uh, this uh, has, uh, uh, has a, a notification. Um, uh, we have uh, retweets. Retweets is like a repost exactly the same, the same uh the same tweet uh, uh we have quotes and uh, quotes it's like uh, a retweet but you can add uh 
add uh, new information in this tweet. Uh, okay, we have uh, global visibility. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, for for the API. We we can only get uh, the one per the one person of the total of tweets. Uh, okay, is uh, this is an example. Uh, a retweet is just uh, repost the 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 tweet, so you don't add uh, new information in, in this. Uh, but a quote, you you can add uh, more information. It's it, this is a, a quote. Uh, for example, it, this is a tweet, and this is a comment. So you you can't comment any any tweet. Okay, uh, the the main issue with with Twitter is that uh, the text uh, may may contain uh, sarcasm. Uh, the sarcasm is uh, is a uh, open problem in uh, in processes of text in in, in text processing and. Um, uh the text uh don't don't give you uh relevant information for for know uh if the if the tweet is uh uh, uh beneficial for you or is some attachment or or whatever and uh, the text uh, is uh, ambiguous and um, we have uh, many bots and trolls. Um, and and Twitter is a direct ne ne uh, direct network. So okay, uh, in this first uh, picture, we have an ugly uh, ugly network, and the shape uh, of this network don't afford uh, uh, relevant information. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, points uh, and the points the, the, the dots are uh, users and the links are uh, uh, any uh, any kind of um, of communication. Uh, we have uh, mentions, we have ret retweets, we have uh, quotes and comments. But uh, we we want. Uh, uh, get uh, a network that express uh, uh, relevant information. So in the in the next uh, picture, uh, we have uh, only uh, the, the retweets. And with this uh, with this uh, picture, we can uh, separate the the principal the the, the mainly uh, groups the pro-government and the anti-government and in the middle uh, we have uh, the users that uh, only uh, repost uh, news about, uh, about uh, COVID. And we, uh, we uh, search um, how is this uh, proportion on the people that uh, retweet and the people that receive uh, a retweet. So it, it's it's interesting thing that the many users, the the more than ninety uh, percent of users, don't send more than four retweets. But with these four retweets, we we have hubs that receive more than than one one thousand retweets. So, so this is interesting because this says uh, much about the the people and the specific um, um, focus uh, on on who uh, people or users you give your uh, your support. Okay, um, this is uh, better than than the last, but this is uh, better than than this. Uh, 
with this uh, new graph, we uh, segregate uh, better the, the groups. And this was uh, make, uh, make it with uh, uh, a tool that is now uh, with the name of uh, Coven Networks. OK. Um, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is the pro-government, the anti-government, and the pink is the the group of uh, COVID news. Um, this should be the right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's Yeah, it's it's about uh, fifty fifty. Um, and we have um, a round of two person that the COVID news, but in the COVID news we we detect uh, uh, bots and the and the three more uh, bigger hub, uh, bigger hubs of of the network. Um, to work with uh, COVID network, we first uh, uh, work with a uh, bipartite network. Uh, the party network is is uh, the network whose nodes uh, can be divided into into sets. Uh, for example, the the, uh, the set uh, U and the set uh, V. No? V are the letters and numbers is uh, or, uh, and the U set are the numbers. So you you work with this. And, and these two sets are uh, disjoint, uh, disjoint sets. Uh, when you want to get a projection, uh, you only check uh, who, 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 who is the, the, the user that you link. So for example, um, to get the projection, the projection for you, you check uh, the numbers who, who, what letters uh, are uh, connected. So, for example, um, uh, one is connected with three and with two, and 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 two is connected with one, with two, with three, and with five. This is for this is because uh, one is connected uh, with a with 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 a. And three is connected uh, with A, so we have uh, a new a new link between them. And uh, uh, two and three is because uh, uh, two and three uh, have uh, the A in common, and and this is for for all uh, the the nodes, and and this is a equal for the projection to to B. So. Uh, when we have the projection, uh, we we basically uh, have the co-event network, and the the event uh, is, uh, for example, a hashtag in common, a retweet in common, uh, or something, whatever you want. Uh, so the wait for for this. Uh, for this uh, link in in the projection is the number of uh, the number of uh, even in, in common between you and the other user. Okay, so uh, this is the pro-government group, the anti-government group, and the COVID news. And with this, uh, with this picture, uh, we can see uh, um, as a segregate uh, network. But with this picture, we can get information about how is uh, the connection between the the different communities. Uh, each each color is for one community, but uh, each. Um, uh, cluster, uh, it's uh, related to the to the big group, uh, to the political group. So 
uh, for the anti-government group, we only uh, found uh, two two communities. Uh, th this uh, this blue and this uh, green or or something like that. Um, but for the pro-government uh, group, we uh, found uh, six uh, six communities, and each community for the pro-government group uh, are highly uh, uh, highly inter interrelation uh, in be between them. But for the case of uh, anti-government, we we don't see that. Uh, it uh, for the for the COVID news it's uh, it's more uh, like like the pro-government groups. Why? Uh, this is because uh, I I suppose that the pro-government group are more uh, coordinate than the anti-government group. So th this coordination. Uh, uh, get uh, a more interrelated uh, uh, connections. Um, yeah, uh, activists and politics and politicians and and bots and um, people that receive uh, money for for their retweets. Okay, so what happened if if with this uh, with this network uh, we uh, remove the less heavy links because be, because this is a, a a network with with uh, links uh, weighted. So if we remove uh, the the less heavy links, we we get the this next this next. Uh, network and and this is interesting because the the only uh group that um was conserved was and uh, what this group the the covid news and and it's this and the other groups uh, uh doesn't uh, conserve their their uh connections their shape uh okay so what happened if if we uh, remove progressively uh, the the ne the next uh, link the next uh, uh, less heavy less heavy links? Okay, um, we found that for the first three uh, uh, three common events, we have uh, uh, an abrupt uh, de uh, decay. But when for for the next uh, uh, for the next wave, we have that this uh, this uh, feeder with a uh, power low. So we uh, suspect that this is because this uh, here we only have uh, the two per the two person of the users uh, of of this uh, network. So we suppose that in in this uh, in this case uh, we have a real uh, society, not not bots or 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 not uh, in in the same in the same way that that this. Okay, um, when we just uh, uh, plot the the weight. Uh, uh, the, the weight of the, uh, the, the 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 degree weighted, we we can uh, found the three uh, main um, uh, bots, and and these uh, these bots uh, are are here, and these bots uh, is uh, COVID news and something uh, related. Okay, this is an example of the pro-government group. Uh, the pro-government group uh, have uh, pictures and, and words uh, relate with the uh, AMLO and, and uh, 
uh, I forget uh, mm, uh, for transformation, uh, whatever. And for the anti-government, uh, they have uh, words and 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 pictures uh, relate with uh, and the the opposite. And we we get uh, this uh, picture for the the principal hubs, and for uh, this uh, has the name bot in in, in the screen name. Okay, what happened is if we renormalize uh, the weight for um, if we want to detect uh, how is the relation between two users. Uh, for example, in, in the previews, uh, you only have uh, one, uh, how many times you uh, coincide, coincided with uh, whatever user in repose the exactly the same the same uh, tweet, but what happened if we uh, want uh, just uh, uh, just just know uh, how the 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 many times that you retweet uh, something, how times you coincided with with the other, and and how it's important this uh, relation. Um, for example, uh, the the other user only retweet a tree, and you retweet um, uh, one thousand uh, of tweets. So the interaction, the 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 common uh, retweets between uh, me and you, uh, doesn't uh, has uh, relevance because uh, I I retweet much more li like you than, than you. So when we use this uh, new renormalization, we uh, found that the bots uh, are uh, uh, has uh, many ha have many 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 uh, interactions, but these uh, interactions are weak uh, inter interactions. So this uh, is confirmed for weak links, but if if we uh, increment the the weight. Um, for for filter, we get the the middle uh, graphic. This uh, the middle graphic is uh, a graphic composed but groups around of uh, six uh, users. The, the, this is the 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 average, and if we uh, increment uh, the the weight other uh, for uh, up of uh, point uh, zero point uh, three, we get this uh, this uh, this kind of picture. And um, in this, uh, we have uh, many 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 users that have uh, a linking only with other. Uh, we we have uh, dyads, um, and these are not. Um, not uh, I I not plotted this because it's the ninety person or something like that. Uh, but in this picture we can see uh, triads. The majority are triads, and uh, one um, the the red groups are, are for for four uh, users. Okay, uh, the conclusions is that uh, we, with uh, statistics, statistics, uh, statistics, statistical methods, uh, can we use it for, to detect uh, different behaviors? Um, we found that uh, only the two person of the nodes uh, present a closer in versus in the green with a power law behavior. Um, uh, we have um, found a complementary test uh, to the more sophisticated methods that use uh, machine learning, deep learning, or something like that. And we found a relatively simple way to uh, segregate the social, uh, the real social interactions uh, without, without the need of, of use uh, machine learning or text, text mining. 
uh, this work was with with this team uh, and the first two are are my advisors and the next are um, my friends <laughs> Okay, this this was the the first uh, approach. What? Those are your friends, and we are the folks. Uh, I don't have uh, folks. <laughs> um, th this was the first uh, approach, but um, was uh, hardest that we we thinking. Okay, um, we have uh, two data sets. The Mexican data sets, it's uh, data uh, well, that was uh, collected in 37 uh, classes in, in Mexican schools. And the age for uh, the response in the, in the classes uh, varied between uh, 9 and 23 years. And uh, we decide uh, only get the the data for for uh, students between uh, ten and fifty years old. The group size is around of twenty eight students, and each individual had to indic uh, indicate uh, five person five persons with uh, she or he uh, uh, has a friendship. And the, the same for the disliking persons or folks. Uh, for the Hungarian uh, data set, uh, we have uh, found uh, a data set that has uh, 43 uh, first degree of high school classes in seven, seven schools. Uh, the average age uh, was for uh, 15, um, point, uh, 90 years and the group, the group size are around of, uh, 70 and, and 39 students. Um, for this, uh, they only, uh, ask to the, to the students and mention, uh, the enemy and the people that dislike you, the, the friends and people that uh, um, when when where you like to uh, to pass time. Okay, for the Mexican uh, case, we have uh, this uh, this example of a uh, classroom. Uh, each node is a different student, and the links are uh, a relation. The blue is for a post and the red is for uh, friends. But the thickness, um, uh, the, the thickness lines is for uh, reciprocal uh, uh, relation, uh, friends or enemy. So uh, we can, um, we, we, we can, we, uh, we can uh, see that the more uh, thickness uh, lines are red, and this is because uh, the friendship is is more uh, probably it's it's most uh, more common, and we have uh, some uh, lines uh, in blue in, in, with 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 the thickness. But uh, okay, um, we have uh, the most uh, uh, uh people uh, was. Uh, people that have uh, many friends, but has uh, but, but but who has uh, some uh, enemies. Okay, uh, this is the uh, distrib the distribution for for this, and the the lines the the group lines are the real data, and the step uh, the step line is. Uh, the approximation with a model. Uh, equal the red is for French, uh, for, for friends, and the blue are for for enemies. 
it's our it's our model, a new model. Okay, uh, for the Mexican case, we can see that it's not than different uh, friends and enemies. But with Hungarian case, uh, we have this, and this is a um, common uh, example. And we can see that the most of the of the lines are red and are thickness lines. So this is uh, interesting because uh, the the only difference between this and the Mexican, apart of one, our Mexican ideologies <laughs> are European, uh, uh, is that in in this in this uh, data set don't uh don't ask for five uh friends or 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 foes just uh, ask uh, that each student mention and and it's it's all uh we have only one uh line with with a thickness uh, uh we, we we only have a blue line with a thickness uh of uh, reciprocal uh uh, communication between between those between those nodes, but but it's the only in the in in all the network. The the rest of the blue lines are no no are reciprocal. And we we uh, check the data with the model with the our models, um, and we uh, filter. Uh, um, I think that it's a very good fit, um, but this is uh, very different uh, uh, than the other because in, in this we have uh, a similar friendship, but for the enemies we we have that this uh, graph uh, is it's more um, uh, closely to uh, to five or something like that. Okay, we uh, suspect that the the similarity in in the case for Hungarian and Mexican case uh, in the in the friendship is because uh, has a a relation with the close friends of Dunbar. This is uh, the, the there are the circles of 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 Dunbar. But by by false, uh, we have uh, a totally different uh, behavior. So for the case of uh, Ungren data, uh, we have 55% uh, of the student didn't uh, receive uh, any mention. Um, the maximum number of mention uh, by a fall was uh, was eight. But by the Mexican case, uh, we just uh, has uh, only uh, eighteen percent of the students didn't have any mention as a fall. This is because uh, you ask uh, the student for five for five uh, enemies. Um, in the maximum number of mention uh, was uh, uh, twenty two, and and for friends are only just um, 30, 13 mentions. Okay, the, the difference uh, we can see in this uh, graph, uh, when we uh, count the friends and we count the, the friends and um, enemies, we in in Mexican data we have uh, displays in in the in the case of we count all friends and, and foes, but for the Hungarian case uh, it's basically the the same the same graph. Okay, uh, this this is all. Yeah. Well, you must mention that this uh, latest part is still developing. So I thought you were going to present the model. 
Yeah. But you didn't. <laughs> okay. We have a mathematical model to predict these things. And the good thing about the model is that could reproduce the Hungarian and the Mexican things, which couldn't be more different, really. Yeah. So you, you can model that with the same basic ideas. So questions, please. All right. Julia, and then. Well, first of all, many congratulations, Alberto, for your prize in your master's degree in your thesis. And uh, I wanted to ask you, in the first results on Twitter that you showed, there were many, many remarks in Twitter against the government because of the way COVID was treated. So I wonder how did you select those? Because apparently you are putting away all the ones that have to do with COVID, while COVID was a big issue in, in Mexicans politics. Okay, uh, we just uh, filter the, the tweets by uh, keywords. Um, when, when in the conversation uh, uh, was the uh, topic about uh, COVID and the uh, national uh, 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 sorry, I forget the, the word. Uh, the uh, uh, the salute uh, for for uh, the, the 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 government the the public health uh, when when we have this uh, uh, get the the data when we uh, segregate the the network uh, we use uh, the Louvain uh, method to get the the communities and when we uh, get the communities. After that, we uh, uh, select uh, uh, random, um, approximately uh, 100 users uh, to each group. And after that, we uh, found that these groups uh, have an affinity to pro-government uh, or anti-government or, or COVID news. But uh, before that, we, we don't know uh, any of, of these users. Okay, yeah, I have uh, <clears throat> one very short question, uh, which is um, the Hungarians, uh, what were the, how many friends and foes did they have to indicate? And the second is, well, the, the, the fits are quite different, and not in this picture, but in the previous one. It, it seems like the fit to the Hungarians is much better than for the Mexicans. Right. Can you give a reason why you think uh, that with the questions you asked, the fits are better? <laughs> okay, uh, about the feeder, uh, we think that the problem was that for Mexican case, we have uh, less data. Uh, we have a round of uh, 11 uh, classrooms, and for Hungarian, we have uh, 47 or something like that. Uh, the restriction uh, has um, insert uh, a noisy in the, in the sign up, uh, but just in the in the enemy's case. But I suspect that this is for for the sample uh, because th this is only in the in the case of of false, not, not in the in the friends. We should mention that in the model, I mean, you have to have an algorithm and how people choose their friends and their enemies, right? And choosing the algorithm for the friends is easy because of homophily. I mean, the ones who are more similar to your way of thinking are your friends, and the ones who separate more are not your friends. But you know, to choose it, you have to choose an enemy. That's a different matter. People are very reluctant to point out to somebody, yeah? And what we found is in the Mexican data, there is a public enemy number one, which in this room might be, could be me, for instance, right? If you were asked to vote who is the loudest person in the world, probably I will be the one you choose. And the way you choose your enemies is quite different. You, you don't look at homophily and things, and I, f I tend to forget. Uh, clustering between us and degree. Yes, you have to take into account 
between us and centrality. You mean, you have to take into consideration how important in the network that people is, right? So if I want to be an enemy of the director of the institute, I mean, I have to think twice, right? Something like that. It's quite interesting. Okay. In the in the first presentation, by Twitter, you mentioned in your second conclusion that only 2% of the cases, two nodes, two snobby nodes, present a clustering okay, with a power law behavior, which is normal, usual for social network. That means that 98% of your nodes yeah. are bots. Or, I mean, then, then you, your uh, model should be divided between the normal social nodes and the bots. I remember Elon Musk playing that, you know, two tutor was really a bad system because you had too many, too many bots. So in your uh, in your Mexican case, you have ninety eight percent, almost all bots. Uh, I I don't know, but I, I think that the ninety eight percent is a behavior. Uh, uh, behavior that that in in the first uh, interactions the, in the first three interactions uh, for example in the in the first three uh, uh, common events uh, we we don't uh, fit uh, this uh, uh, network with with the power law. So I think that these first uh, three uh, um, uh, common events in 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 the population uh, hasn't afford uh, relevant information about if they they are bots or not. But I think that this is not a uh, uh, organic uh, behavior. We should, you can you can investigate, then you can find out if those ninety eight percent are bots or not with your data. No, 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 no. The the bot it's just I mean just the 98 percent that behave strangely. Can you identify them? It's a way to say for sure that they are bots or not. Not. No, no. Say it? No. Ah, yeah, yeah. The, we 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 only have the the, the opposite the, the opposite because uh, we uh, are sure that these uh, two person the uh, are uh, real people. Okay. Any any more questions? Yeah. The question is that uh, we we were able to to do this uh, research because. The data were for free before in Twitter. Now it is not possible to do it. So, um, so we actually wanted to continue doing things like that with different topics and things, but it's difficult. It's important to remark that this work was made before Elon Musk decided to buy the company. So. We publish this, we say it's 90, 98% or, and he said the same thing after. <laughs> so that's an independent confirmation because we, we didn't know that. We just found this 97, 98. So uh, the problem is that it's very big. Okay, you need to verify millions of Twitters if you really want to see if these are bots or not. And the problem is how to do it because you have, it depends on the language, the person, sarcasm, knowledge, there are many, it's almost, it's a, it's a complete it, it, it's a, research by itself. But, but anyway, Elon Musk confirmed that. <laughs> The time of response between a tweet and a retweet. And if it, that is instant, it's usually by a bug, right? It's an automatic uh, answer. 
So, and, and by doing that, you just take out practically all of the bugs. But there are some that are very difficult to stop out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, we are. Okay, it's three o'clock. We are going to start the afternoon session. Okay. Now that's all right. Okay, so we are ready for the afternoon session. And let me introduce you to Jan uh, Snellman. And well, he's, he's also coming from Finland. Actually, he was explaining to me what he's working at the moment in Finland, but he, he in Alto University, but he also worked in social physics, social physics, right? And he's going to talk us about modeling socioeconomics during epidemics, the simplest reasonable approach that we could come up with. So thank you so much for coming to Mexico. We are very happy to have you here. And with, uh, with, else, with anything else, let him give us our talk. His talk. Thank you. So can you, now you can hear me, yes. <laughs> Yes, so I, that's why I was saying I was, I have been working in collaborating with uh, these people here, most of whom are present here in this, uh, in this symposium, with the exception of my Finnish taskmaster, Mike Kopi Lag, and uh, Daria Vareo, who, whom I know they are Cecilia, and so, and uh, who has uh, contributed much to these results that we have been working on. So, and so, in any case, so, as we can all remember, the pandemic, of course, caused singular, singular disruptions to the everyday life of, uh, of in, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the life in the societies and so on. So, and the, and then, of course, there was this fear of this new uh, strange disease and the, and then the governments took very, took measures to mitigate this pandemic and the, and then, of course, the economies of, of the world, uh, they took a hard hit from this, or all, all from this sphere. And then, of course, the government measures. And the, and then, of course, one of the, in the public discourse, this, of course, spawned this question that, and this discourse about whether it is worth shutting down the economy in order to protect, protect the public health. That is one of, that was one of the key sort of, uh, Discussions that emerged from the uh, from the pandemic in the public, and then of course we well the a, a question that we uh, sort of started thinking uh, researching about in during this uh, uh, these early times was that we about how to model this sort of interaction where because of course you can all uh, understand that the that how people react to the pandemic, it has an effect on this epidemic itself, of course, that if people thought that if people stay at home and then, and then be, uh, are very careful not to sp spread the disease, then of course the, the disease will probably not spread as much as if the opposite is the case. And so, and so basically, so, and then now what I was doing before the pandemic is this, so, uh, PTAs that, and that is my, uh, well, with Timo talk about the, of course, we heard about him talk about the, how the social, uh, flaws of, uh, or the, so, how the, so, how the social physics laws are not yet, are not yet known, but the, but then, of course, since the, the social systems do not, uh, do not work randomly, then, of course, there must be some sort of governing principles. And then this uh, PTH is my sort of a proposal for one of these uh, governing principles. And the, and the idea is here yeah, that the, it is stands for the better than hypothesis. And the idea is that we, that, that, that the main motivation of people is to, to obtain the highest, uh, uh, Social standing uh, in relation to uh, relative to other people, and the of course this this is of course in their own mind because there are many ways to 
to measure the social selling as we will see later, basically. And then, of course, I usually, before I made, before the pandemic hit, I had basically used this, or oh, sorry, this, so this uh, hypothesis using uh, social networks and agent based models, basically, or complex social net networks. And then at the beginning, beginning of the pandemic, I was sort of considering if I could so make some sort of a model which with which we could uh, model the econ economies and especially uh, formation of currencies and so how, about how the certain things like like diamonds become very uh, valuable in the eyes of people while things like water is not so valuable even though it is necessary and this is a well-known water diamond paradox from the economics so well, I was to, uh, planning to do this, but then I did not get before uh, go much. Up. I did not go much as much with this other than a, some sort of simple prototype or so. But the, because the pandemic hit, of course, and then during the pandemic, the first year, of course, uh, Kimmo introduced me to the work of Raphael, of course, about the the. And the especially this uh, sort of geographical sales model that he has been studying for a long time. From and this is the this is the exact uh, reference that that basically I was uh, I then studied the modeling the of geographical spread of influenza a H one N one the case of Mexico from 2013, and then of course. And then, of course, I was, when I was successful that I could also take part in Rafael's project. And then I, of course, I thought that from my background, of course, that my, that my first instinct, of, of course, was to, well, why not put some socioeconomic features into this Rafael's model, basically. And that's what I set out to do then. Then I was, when I started this current process, basically. And so basically the background here is this is the well well this is this is the sort of a a illustration of the of the sales part of the model, the uh, original Rafael Small uh, and the and then of course we have different uh, and this compound metal this is a compound metal model uh, which and which has geographical features basically Basically, we have your typical series or a, you have your typical epidemic model, compartmental epidemic model, in which, of course, you have these compartments of people that are either susceptible to, to, to the disease, they exposed or already infected or the, or, or recovered from the disease. And then these people then, of course, just, uh, that sort of uh, transfer to the each of the uh, through these uh, compartments as they get sick or get exposed and so on. So, so that and these models have been you uh, have been in use since uh, 1930s already. And the and then of course the and the and then we of course we got this the sales model because the because of the the of the way the people uh, move according from these uh, compartments. So we, they start as susceptible, then go to exposed when they come into contact with infected people, and then they may get infected, then and then and then they will recover or maybe die from the disease, and then and this bring bring us this sales name basically here, and so and then. This is the, uh, in the, uh, the geography in this model basically works in the, uh, in the way that the, that you basically put, uh, in, in, so, so that this sales uh, model is, uh, is cooperating in, uh, that basically you take a map, uh, and here it is a Mexico, uh, I don't know if you can see it well basically here, but the, but in any case, you take a map and then divide it into uh, small geographical cells, and then 
then each of them has the, its own sales mechanics, and then the and then the ep epidemic spreads from one cell to the other through some random work processes, or the or then the or we are so uh, we are things like airports or railroads, and the and then of course. You can see in this figure that the how this characteristically works is more that the of course there is one place where the epidemic starts and then it uh, shifts into the other cells and the and then the acid yes and the and then it it basically has these uh, characteristic wave-like uh, structures and that. Uh, or wave-like behaviors they hear that can be seen here, but the but then of course the since the in this simulation it also the infection also does via airports, then it of course it can it will eventually end up in many places, and then the you get this multiple wave fronts here. So that's the this is a one of the original sim simulations that I uh, studied. So of the original sales model, and then of course, then, then how? Now this is the whole picture of the of this hybrid model with, with which I came up with, with in collaboration with Rafael Kim and the people here, of course. And then the the idea here is that we have this now the the sales part here is basically the same, but now the I didn't tell you before, but now the we basically take this map, whole map, and then we subdivide it into uh, smaller districts, and then these districts, then they uh, uh, are sub uh, subdivided further into these cells. So, so basically, we say that some of these cells basically comprise a, they make a basically a larger district, and then the, and then this larger, and then the. And and then with these larger districts are then uh, they are governed by authority agents or it, this is an agent-based model where we have these districts governed by authority agents who give uh, who give uh, restrictions to or recommendations for the populations of these cells so uh, to cells to. Uh, to implement basically, so so these authorities say, they say that you cannot go out, you can, you must do, you must have a mask and so on. So and so and they and then the population agents they they make a contribution that they and that to uh, to helping the or to helping the mitigate the pandemic and the this contribution that then. It basically goes to. Uh, it has an effect on the local, on the district-wide economy, basically, and then the, and then then also the, the, spreading is a probability of this disease. So, and then of course the epidemic progression, how it progresses, the, the district-wide uh, infection rates, uh, they. They have an effect on the uh, decision making, uh, making of the authorities. How, and then, and then, then, then of course, the cell white this white uh, infection rates have an effect on how the populations in these smaller cells act, basically. And these are the actions that they, they can take. That population, this X here is basically a reduction in economic activity that this economic agents can make to mitigate the pandemic and then the and this uh, larger X here was the of course the restrictions that the uh, governments put in place and the and then they do also have a effect on the how the population agents uh, act basically and let's see so so how does this work in practice and the, what is this this uh, how this PDS how, how does it come into picture here? So in PTAs we have this. I use this. Sorry. Well, I have this sort of utility function. Utility function is basically a thing that is uh, that the um, 
that the agents think that is basically a good, uh, good thing and then what they want to maximize or basically, or basically this says that how must a different change in their circumstances or how much they benefit or are harmed by this things. And so, so basically we have here a, this is a sort of a part of the, this is what is first time here in this sort of, in this AI alpha I here is the, the absolute part of the, of the, uh, of the utility function. And then here we have the relative part of the, of the utility function where the I agents compare each other to other agents in the, in their vicinity or whom, who they know basically. And this alpha, alpha here, this sub, superscript here is a, some sort of a scale or measure on which the, these agents compete. And then it can basically be anything basically, but the, but, but for example, for example, it can be sort, uh, uh, it can be uh, related to how well off these agents are economically, or they can be, it can be also be about some physical features. So, and then of course, when you have this alpha I, a, I here is the, that is the st standing of the agents I on this scale alpha. So for example, if we think about wealth, then it's maybe some about, maybe the amount of money you own or, or your physical height, basically. And these are the examples of what this can be. That, of course, in the pandemic uh, context, we have some very different uh, uh, measures here, but, the, but then let's, we'll, we'll come to that later. But the, and then this uh, W here is the, is the weight function that basically it can be taught as a, it can be taught as a value that the agent I gives to, 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 to having high standing on the scale alpha, basically. So, and it can be, and this can be uh, interpreted as, as the values this agent has, basically, to, or these collectively, these values, basically. And then, of course, the, and then, uh, of course, it is possible that the, that when, of course, uh, you, of course, uh, you may that well. You when you think that sometimes you want, you may want, for example, for your money amount on your bank account, you may want it to be as high as possible. But then, of course, if you are running in competitions, you want your time to go uh, say one hundred meters. You want it to be as low as possible, so it is possible to. The, uh, the value or value these things uh, in a different uh, order so that you may think that having as high as high, as higher standing in some scale or measuring scale it might be good to have uh, as high standing as possible but then in some other scales you might want to have as low as uh, standing as possible you don't want to come uh, the last one in the in a competition, basically, because then being number one is better than being number 10. And then, of course, it is better to have, say, a million dollars than one dollar. So you, you get the idea, I think. And then the, and then, of course, the absolute value of this, this W then, and then can also be said to say, that the that the that it means that how strong is this desire or uh, to 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 compete on the to stand to have a size standing on this uh, measurement scale alpha. So and then of course if this W zero is zero, then it means that the agent does not care at all about what this standing is in, in on a certain scale. So that is the basically the basic ideas of the PDH. And then and then the in order to to make this agent based model uh, to work in the in this new PDH PDH model, we made these assumptions. We assume, we assume that the agent, 
agents, the population agents and the authority agents, they don't really like having to mitigate the pandemic, but they still do, they do it in a minimal manner. So they make the minimum effort allowed by their uh, utility functions, which means that they basically the utilities are zero. So, so, and then this allows us to solve these the resistance that the authorizations put in place and the and then the the economic effort or the economic sacrifices that the population is, is made straight from the utility functions and the and that's and this is what we thought of was so was reflecting what the governments at the time were doing basically so that this of course means that we cannot there is no head immunity strategy in this BDSA as well as, as such, but, the, but we thought that the, it was an exception rather than a rule that any country basically took this approach. So that's one reason why we took this. But then, then of course, the, one of the bigger reasons might even be that, the, that then, of course, if I was, if we did not do some simplifying, simplifying assumptions like this, I would still be iterating this decision making algorithm of these agents. So it would be, might be possible. So we, uh, I wouldn't, uh, or we would have achieved anything. So uh, in at the end, so that's maybe the uh, one of the two other big reasons why we uh, did, uh, why we, this was a, uh, this good assumptions to make basically for us. So, and so, and then now we go to the, uh, to see what the happens in the heads of these agents that we have. Basically, we have these populations that uh, populate the, these small cells or the smallest cells of the, the circle, say small, so, or the, say, so they have, they value their, or, or, or they, and they, the, uh, this X, the, the economic contribution to mitigating the pandemic is one of their values. And then they want to keep the infection rate low. And then the, we have this, uh, we also call, have this third, uh, we have this third uh, value for them that is the compliance value. Basically, this compliance can, is actually an amalgamation of many different things that can be, co that are, co can be culturally bound, for example. And the, the idea here is that the, it can be uh, respect for the authority in general, that how authoritarian the culture is, for example. But it can also be uh, in interpreted as a sort of a measure on how, on how important people think in culture is uh, about how the different norms are upheld, or or it can even be thought as a measure of how cooperative people are in the culture, or how non-cooperative and so on. So this is a sort of a this is a sort of a composite of these different things. But the but to keep things simple, we had this had this all just just comparison to this one variable, and then as this as as per our assumptions, then since we uh, assume that these agents don't like uh, mitigating the uh, pandemic, we we assume that the these that these values, these these first two values here, they are always negative, while this WC can have both signs. In Finland, we like to think of us as people who uh, obey the rules and so and. Uh, they listen to the authorities and such, and, and then Rafael Asko, of course, says that in Mexico it is kind of like op opposite. So, but then, so, so in any case, this is the population agent value, values, and then we have the author, the values of the authority agents that govern these high, uh, these uh, uh, collections of these uh, different uh, di different cells here. So basically. And their values are they, 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 one of the values is the resistance they put up for the population agents, and then they care about the 
the provincial infection rates and they want to keep them low. And then, but they also worry about the, the economic uh, development on, on, uh, in the in their district, basically. Basically, the thing is that the, that when these population agents, when they take the, when they, they take the measures to, uh, to mitigate the pandemic, it is, in our model, it is linearly affecting the economy. And then, and then when you, uh, sum all these economic hits up, you get the total economic hit, which is this, this, uh, capital set here. And then, of course, from the this assumptions we had, we 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 have similar restriction for the sort of values that the these first two here are and are lower than zero, for example. But then, of course, this WZ is sort of peculiar in the sense that the the divide is larger than zero because this Z is now the the total reduction in economic activity. Then the if it is larger than zero, it implies that the, that, that the authority agents actually liked that the economy gets reduced because of these pandemic measures or so. And so that is, a, many may find that counterintuitive, but, they, but it is not uh, inconsistent with our assumptions. And so, so, and so we basically studied both possibilities, basically, in this case. And so, and then these, we, the basic test we did this with this model was that we, we had this sort of a country divided into a square country divided into, divided into nine different districts. Uh, and the, then, and then they had all uh, uniform population densities. And so, and then we also get these value parameters for all these and mostly uh, mostly, mostly uh, uh, constant, basically in time, especially, and then they they have only four few variations between different populations because, of course, there is no reason why different parts of the country may not have very different values to each other. So, and then, and then the main finding finding that you see demonstrated here is that. The, that the that the compliance of uh, the, the compliance value uh, the value of uh, compliance of the that these populations have it had the most uh, zero, it had the most noticeable effect to the spreading patterns of the epidemic basically let's see if I can now run this uh, simulation so let's see. Yes, so basically the, we have the, in this simulation we have the, uh, we have basically a ring of compliant agents in a otherwise non-compliant country. So, so basically you see that we have these very like, uh, uh, very like spreading patterns in the middle now. And then when you, it gets to this ring, it is uh, so very, it shows this spring of the pandemic, uh, epidemic, uh, shows very much. And they, and as you can see, there is, is the, the pattern is very chaotic. That's the other striking thing about the simulation. And the, and then of course, and then when it's just, when it basically breaks out of the, of this ring, as you can see now, it, what happens is that they, these sort of wave-like patterns return, of course, in this, uh, not, don't go blind outer regions. And so, and then, yes. So, and then, of course, it happens everywhere, of course. And the, and once it has, and once it, the epidemic has spread everywhere, then this behavior is periodic. And so, so it basically repeats as, as many times as the, as this simulation goes, which is something like 1,000, 1 or 1,500 uh, time units. The, and the time units here in the simulations are thought 
as days. And so that's the, that's the demonstrative simulation of the, pan, uh, of the, epi, uh, of the epidemic. And then, yes. So, and so uh, as you can see, there are two, uh, well, but there are two uh, basic uh, spelling patterns we could find. We had this, we had this sort of wave-like pattern here that happens that is associated with the low compliance, and then in the high compliance case we had this sort of slow and chaotic pattern here. And we basically, well, in these first basic tests we were basically just finding the where we were just about. Uh, that's fine, finding this is most striking spreading patterns. And so, and then, and then, of course, the, and then, and once we got to the, the found these basic, uh, basic behavior patterns, we basically started uh, wondering if we could find some other spread patterns here using some computerized tools. So, and then of course, and then of course the, we also found out that the, that the, while the other value parameters, of course, they did have some effects, but they, uh, that they were mostly on the infection rates and such on the economic, uh, development in these districts and so on. So, so basically they, they did not, uh, change much the overall spelling patterns that we saw to here. And then we, and then of course, and then to do this value parameter survey, of course, we saw that there were in total of six different types of value parameters. And they, and then of course, the, the, this is of course a very challenging thing to make this sort of a six dimensional value parameter survey. And so, and then, of course, we found a way to simplify this system a little bit because the, we found out that the coin, coin equations of the of these uh, coin, coin equations of these uh, uh, of these agents agents. Uh, this is this is uh, making algorithms could be written in the form form that only had some ratios of these uh, value parameters there instead of all the six basically and this uh, allowed us to to reduce the dimensionality of this parameter survey to four which is uh, still a massive amount of simulations and then we basically uh, well we chose uh, some 50,000 uh, 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 sets of value parameters that we tested uh, with some variations in them small variances in them, and then we tested the, in the vicinities two, uh, we, uh, we tested two of these value parameters, or the, we made two simulations in the vicinities of these, each of these value parameter sets, so, so to, we had a total of one, uh, 10 to the 5 simulations to, to survey, and the, this is of course impossible to do by hand. And so we turned to some simple, uh, uh, some simple uh, machine learning techniques. And so then these were the self-organizing maps by Kohonen, my countryman basically. And the, where he, this is a analysis tool that basically which basically maps the feature vectors that you put into them into into a set uh, or the sets of objects. You, they maps it maps it them into the into a two dimensional matrix according to their similarity. This is a very simple uh, simple uh, tool, a machine learning tool. And the and then the second uh, ma machine learning tool that we made use of was the principal component analysis or PCA. This is a linear transformation of the, of this, uh, speed of a feature vector or the space, space of the objects that you put into them. It, it basically uh, arranges these objects in along the axis that contribute most to the, to the variance between the, between the, 
between the objects themselves. And so this is a useful in, uh, in solving, uh, uh, in visualizing the uh, clusters that you can find in these uh, simulations. Or, and so basically we, we basically put these uh, 100,000 simulations into these PCI and some and we use multiple different ways of making feature vectors out of these simulations. And then we found that the, that the two of the easiest ones to classify with these si si simple tools were the, that when we classify the, when we basically take the average inferior rates in the ease of the uh, simulation and then make a feature vector out of them. And then you, and then you get results like, uh, this basically, and then the, and then the, and then the, it's found basically three clusters, and the, and then this, this is the dream, this is a three dimensional PCA transform space in which this resource is shown. So basically, these colors are from some, but the, but the clustering is by the PCA basically, and so, so you can see that the, that there's one, uh, one cluster which is very clear shown here, seen here, and then one is which is basically divided in two, but uh, it is a little bit, uh, you can see how this might be a different cluster, this one here, this clear one basically. But, and then if you basically uh, transfer, so what this look like, what this looks like in a, in this sort of value parameter space where we have collapsed, collapsed one of the value parameters into this three-dimensional space, it looks a bit like this. And then, of course, when you look at this value for the, this compliance value for the, for the population agents, you see that the, this orange uh, cluster here is the most, is the one that was shown here and it is very distinct while the blue and green clusters are sort of in the blue cluster especially is between this green and the and this orange one and so and so since this green one actually is it is a low compliance actually negative compliance and very low compliance and the and then the orange ones have a high compliance we then identify that these are these clusters are basically, this is the, this, uh, coin cluster is the one, the cluster that is basically comprised of these critically behaving simulations and the, and these green ones are the ones that are, are the, uh, wave-like uh, behaving, uh, behaving simulations basically. And so, and then of course, this blue one here is sort of, some sign kind of a transitional transitional state, which looks something like this when simulated. So, so basically, you can see that there is some sort of wave-like pattern still visible, but it is this it is a very chaotic one. So, and then this is this we call the broken wave uh, uh, spinning pattern that we saw here, basically. And then, of course, the the other classification that also gave us some uh, easily interpretable uh, results was the classifying them according to how strong uh, restrictions these uh, these corners could put in place there, these other areas put in place, and they look in PCSA space you see that the, the, these clusters, there are clearly two clusters that are basically glued together in this region uh, here. And then the, it is very, behaves in a very simple way in, in this, uh, in the same way in the, in the value parameter space, because the, in here, the, the authority agents concern for the economic development in their, in their, uh, uh, this is, is the dominating factor that the, if they, the, if the authority agents have positive WZ, then they have, then they, we have, they all are all in this key, uh, this blue cluster. And then 
the for the items in the points cluster, they have negative WZ. So, so basically, what this means is that the what we found out that the here that the Yes, here we have the principal axis here, and then here we have the parameter values. I'm sorry that they are so small, say, really. But in any case, the, the Z value here is this WZ, uh, WZ uh, value parameter here, and the and then we basically the interpretation of this result is basically that the that if the these if these authority agencies they are not afraid of uh, if they are not afraid of the of reducing their economies in their districts then they will put up higher uh, sixes and that's the that's the, the interpretation of this one and it's very straightforward. Very straightforward, and so well, and then of course, yes. So basically, when we well with this, basically, we well with Matthias, we were doing some, we we were doing some also some more advanced techniques. We were applying also when some more advanced techniques into this because the. The reason we have, do not show any uh, any economic uh, classifications here is because they they basically had some uh, they basically were uh, basically had some uh, they were sort of a single clusters that had sort of a sort of a lines that the the, the simulations were then basically in lines there in a weird manner a little bit like this there. And with uh, Matthias, we had the, we used some more advanced uh, uh, methods to, like UMAP and DSME to classify them as well. But the, but then of course, only yesterday I realized that it is my, it might have been a very beautiful figures to show. And so, uh, so, so, so sorry, I am not, not, do not have those figures. And the, uh, the thing is, of course, that the, that then the, well, the, uh, this, my, uh, my supervisor, basically, Kimmo, Rafael, and at all, basically, well, these simple results were good enough, basically. Uh, it is the same thing as with the decision of making uh, algorithm of the agents, because I could be uh, modifying and improving then still, and then we could be basically also be trying to classify all these results that we got from the simulation still uh, if we did not basically stop somewhere and so so from this well any case the real deal here that we thought what was the most important to concentrate on was the practical application of this model and, and the we chose to uh, to Spain as a target country for this practical application and then the and then, of course, as I told you, the uh, Nadia has uh, Nadia that we have cooperated with has done a lot of work in the meantime. While I was working with the this simple, uh, basically a toy model, basically about he, he was of course perfect in the sales part of the model, so adding the, the effects of the vaccinations and the and then the also the things like strains in the. Uh, of the different strains of the virus and perfecting them in the to the to 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 modeling the infection rates in different countries in in this COVID pandemic and so and then the and then she of course implemented this this into the model and then but then of course we needed the the economic data to compare with this something and they. And then the ideally, this economic uh, activity should be related to the activities such as that bring people together, and then uh, so basically shopping, uh, and then the attending sports or educational similar status, and so on. Basically, anywhere we be, where people congregate, this is some sort of economic or socio-economic activity, basically, 
So this is not just economic, it's also socioeconomic too. And then, and there are, there have been studies of these, of these, of these use of time studies are of course done and they are of course made during the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. And the, and then of course, but the, but we found that the, the data, of course, is based on the questionnaires that are made uh, every now and then. And so, uh, so if we were to use this data, it was only for we had only a few uh, points to fit this economic data into, uh, or social economic data fit to fit into. And so, basically, and then so we basically uh, noted that the that since the connection between our model and the in the, or the connection between the economic or socioeconomic part and the sales part is the, in the mobility, then this would be most sen sensible to use some sort of uh, mobility data and, uh, as a sort of a indicator for what uh, the, the economic activity could be like. And so basically from the, and then what we found and the most, what we found most useful of course was this uh, Eurostat data on tourism and most specifically, specifically this night spent in tourism, tourism accommodation because the, of course it has a connection also to the time that people use in the, in, of course, in this uh, economic activity and tourism as general. And, the, and here we have this sort of a pic picture where we have the the Eurostat data uh, uh, normalized to one for e the countries that the green uh, blue one is Spain, uh, France is Italy, and uh, green is Finland. And you can see, or perhaps you can see that the it is very seasonal and it basically is is very similar from the from the crash of the two thousand and eight. So you know you remember also the the economic crash of 2008 that the, as you can see, it did not have a, a great effect on the, the, on this data set at least. And so, but then of course the, you see very sharp drop during the COVID pandemic times. So, so this is a very good uh, data to compare these, uh, these small results with and then and then from there, we basically constructed, we adjusted these monthly and then put them in, and then, uh, and then normalized and this data to between one and zero. So it is for these three countries here. And the, and then you can see that it for all the, there are some similar strengths, but they are of course not all the same. So. So Spain, you basically have this very sharp drop and the, and then the another very, uh, well, it recovers some, somewhat and then it uh, drops down again and then it's finally normalized somewhat and the, and the trends for Italy are very similar while, while for Finland they are uh, quite uh, not that similar or what it or sim tends are a little bit similar, but they are not completely the same, of course, because, uh, of course, for countries like Spain and Italy, the tourism sector is much more important than for Finland. And so, so perhaps it was not that it did not have such a great effect on Finland then anymore uh, as for Spain and Italy, of course. And then, and then this figure is by Nadia, basically. She basically made this fitting. He, she basically calculated the, she basically fit this, uh, uh, fit this, uh, this, well, she uh, did fit, basically fit this economic data coming from the model to the, to this the tourism data I showed you last slide and the, and then, of course, the uh, one thing we uh, we found out the, the, with this exercise was that the I should also mention some that the the shadow here is basically the area that contains roughly the ninety percent of all the realizations of the model because this is based on a hundred realizations of the model for with similar with the same value parameters and so 
So uh, and so, the this uh, area then reflects the uh, well uh, contains the ninety percent of those because the there were very some outliers which made the standard deviations very high and so so we found that this was the more meaningful uh, error estimate basically and so. So basically, this fitting involved basically not only finding power parameters that produce the best economic fit, and the and then the basically we found out that the we could not uh, replicate this uh, this uh, uh, behavior this well unless we change these value parameters during different times of the pandemic. Then the we basically this is basically justifiable by thinking of the changing of the attitudes of people to the pandemic that, of course, when it first comes, it is very scary. But when you sort of learn to live with it, then you sort of return to the normal and so and so, or some sort, some form of normal and so. So these changing value parameters were the, the was something that we found that, that that we needed to do it here to get this, to get the fit, uh, this good, basically. And then, of course, well, Nadia tried to, uh, to, uh, well, well, uh, she tried to, of course, to, well, she basically did not uh, try to, to fully uh, replicate the infection rates in there because the, these infection rates she has, uh, of course, replicate in other papers with the PSA is moral. And then, then there, of course, the moral is uh, is working and then from there we got of course much of the, the things here but uh, much of the uh, of the advancements we did for this model and the, but then of course the at least some of the trends here are similar to what you can see so at least the trends are similar and it's the uh, as well as the another thing basically that we uh, accomplish this here. And then for the conclusions, of course, the, 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 the basic, uh, behavioral types of these, mo of these, uh, at least in terms of the spraying rates are the, are the very, uh, very fast and wave like forms and then the slow and chaotic forms. And then say, say, transitional, uh, Program wave pattern between these and which we found with the parameter survey. And then the, and then the co compliance of the population agents was the most uh, important or uh, the most significant factor in the, in this, uh, in the determining which of these, uh, uh, patterns is present in a simulation. And the, and then the, we found that the using the storage data, the sales data, the, on the night spent in Tokyo's accommodations, it was possible to, possible to show that the, it was possible to compare this with some real uh, economic data, but then we found that the, the these uh, comparisons needed some uh, uh, adjustment of these value parameters in time. So basically, the, this is one of the future avenues to improve this model. Basically, we can improve it basically by ma putting, making these value parameters to dynamically change in, uh, in the course of the simulation and the some way, for example, by having a total number of, uh, comparing it to the cumulative number of infections, for example, that I have uh, sort of a good reason to think that this might be a good starting point, at least for this whole improvement, because of course, if uh, when you have when the when the disease first arrives, of course there are very few people infected. So it is sort of what we call in Finland a negative lottery win to have this disease first. But when it sort of when you have many many uh, infections in cumulatively, of course, then it becomes normal, and you don't you do not you do not fear it as much because. It no longer is a. It no longer puts you uh, different as you from others in a bad way. So that's the one way of thinking is that the 
that people are often uh, irrationally afraid of some, some very rare threats, such as such like, uh, attacks when compared with the, some uh, uh, threats that basically concern all, so like the like the uh, air pollution. Or, uh, so everyone suffers from air pollution, so it is normal, and so no one cares about it. But then the socket attack happens only for a few people, and so. So having this sort of bad thing happen to you when you are when you are so few in number, it's you you basically compare you yourself basically to everyone else, and so you are very afraid of this of having this sort of a disaster happen to you. So so that's this is basically the state of the art and what we have accomplished accomplished to this state, and the and that's uh, what I will end with. So. So any questions then? Oh. Well, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, yes, I think we have the time for perhaps one or two quick questions, and then we will have time for to discuss at five o'clock. So please, uh, if you have, and let me tell you that I love the name BTH. It's a great idea. So, well, uh, any question? Rafael? Sure, I they will give you a microphone. Yeah. Well, I noticed that in your results, uh, the predicted infection rates was much higher than the real thing. And that might be thought as a failure of the model, but probably not. What this is telling you that precisely in the recent times in the pandemic, the number of cases must be much higher than the ones that are reported, yeah? Because people just don't go to hospital anymore and they just, you don't know if they have COVID or not. Uh, so that is sort of the model is reflecting the actual disease, not the way you, you react to, uh, to it. So I regard this plot as very accurate as a prediction <laughs> rather than a comparison, right? Uh, it was not very clear to me, and if it was not clear to me, to anybody probably, uh, is that uh, uh, the BTH, you have considered three criteria, say, that people so uh, preoccupied for the economy, preoccupied for the infection rate, uh, preoccupied for what else? I mean, nothing else? It, or, because the compliance is a result of the other two, right? So, in a sense, the two parameters are different from the compliance one, right? Because the compliance is such a such psychological attitude. So that's why you can move it freely. Uh, and the others are not. I mean, it's just sort of natural reaction of people against some situation. Yeah. So, would you like to explain a little bit more the role of these uh, weights? So, the role of these weights, then. So, basically, you are asking about the well, uh, well, the yeah, well, the about the these uh, values, then. And so, basically. So basically, uh, you talked uh, talk about the this basically this uh, these being some. So did you think that these were some sort of a natural parameters in the sense that the that whenever there is a epidemic, then people have these uh, values because and then or what because the way I see it is that basically the these two value parameters basically come into play. Then there is an epidemic, of course, and the and then this uh, and this uh, compliance then is a more stable or cultural thing, basically, because this, of course, every, all the time you have this uh, people are uh, well, the, because this the sort of respect that people have for authority or or how strong the norms are in a society, the the, the those. Do not tend to change very much, basically, in time. But then, of course, 
then of, of course these two this is uh, this first value parameter is of course the this is basically you can think of it as a, a sort of a how bound about this population agents are to to basically to mitigate this pandemic or if it if it was positive but then then of course then we are we assume that the they do not really like it and of course we have to put make it negative so so basically this is sort of a special value param uh, value that uh, these are two uh, per, per, in the sense special values that come into play then there's an epidemic and then this is sort of a stable thing that the that is sort of uh, a more uh, more or less constant for different cultures and so this third one and then the same goes for these uh, for the alternate agents that the of course if there is no pandemic they they have of course no reason to even think about putting some sort of restrictions to put to uh, restrict a or mitigate the epidemic that doesn't exist, basically, and then the same with the this infection rate value parameter here. So, and then of course this worry about the economic activity is the same thing. It's a sort of a it's same same as with the as the compliance that it is a sort of a more stable thing that the different. Uh, Governments may have different values that they put into this economic performance. So, and so, and 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 that's why. But the, this, I think, the, it tends to say so, so sort of uh, sort of a constant, at least in the scale of decades, uh, and sometimes even in centuries. And so, and so. Okay, and actually, that is connected to. Why do you choose Spain as a, say, as an example of how this works? I and mean, it's precisely because of that, because, well, apart from the reason that there's a lot of data about Spain, eh, every day or monthly data, eh, well, on the other hand, Spain is a very touristic place, so the economy is very much affected by the mobility of people. And on the other hand, and the authorities are rather, are rather, I wouldn't say autocratic, but <laughs> I don't know if if Aurora <laughs> agrees with me. But there have been many changes in the time of measures they have been taking during the pandemic. Yeah, if they went to imitating China in locking up everybody at the beginning of the pandemic to really don't don't care about it very much because the the tourism industry matters much more than people dying everywhere, right? Yeah. Well, I think that this could be follow up at five o'clock. But yes, I think it's really interesting how compliance is cultural. And I am sure that in this very international group that you had, compliance was very different in Latin America than in Europe. Well, <clears throat> well just to mention some differences that we sometimes have. So, well, thank you very much. Please, let's clap again. Thank you. Yes. And uh, yeah, we are going to ask for Gerardo to join us. Well, as, as you have noticed, we have been going from Finland to Mexico, and then Finland again, and we are coming back to Mexico. <laughs> Uh, we haven't been reading the curricula of our speakers because we all have it in the program. But it's, it's, we, have, we are having a very interesting mixture of ages and activities. And uh, now we are going to hear Gerardo. Gerardo García Naunas. Who, as you know, is a very good scientist who works here at the Instituto de Física de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. And it's my pleasure to introduce him in his talk about cloud patterns and its importance for global warming. Uh, so please, Gerardo, well, we are ready. Thank you very much, Julia. We are very happy to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. Especially here. And also, I would like to thank Rafael for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to give a talk that, um, in fact, this is the first time that I give this talk. So maybe I'm, I'm a little bit rusty, 
concerning the subject, but it's good for me. So, um, <laughs> so this, this talk, where is it? Oh, it's here. Okay. It's a little bit strange, but this talk, uh, um, this work was made with Diana Monroy. She was my undergraduate student. And, and it's about cloud patterns and the importance for global warming. So we had a talk about the last apocalyptic event. Now we are going to have a talk about the next one, which is global warming. If there is no third world war, but if not, this is going. So um, the idea is first I'm going to give a, an introduction about the subject, why cloud patterns are important, why they're important for uh, pattern formation. Then I'm going to talk about a model that is, uh, that is a linear model, which works based on diffusion. And eventually it's, it's a spin model, okay? With some spin model with some dynamics. But then uh, yeah, we are going to see that this is not enough to explain the pattern formation, of course. So you need, so we end up doing a stochastic gimbal lambda model, which is not enough. So we ended up doing a stochastic Swift Hohenberg uh, model with the stochastic terms, and this, this worked very nicely for explain most of the cloud patterns that you can see in the atmosphere. So let me start saying something that in fact, the, our initial motivation was not global warming or something apocalyptic, it's just for poetry, beauty, and chance. Chance because I was, uh, I was teaching fluid dynamics, and so I had a, very smart student. She was asking all the time questions. At some point we were discussing. She told me that she was from a small town. I asked her what town. And she said, well, you're, you're never going to imagine what's the name of my town because it's very small in the mountains, Mexico, close to, I'm sorry, I don't know what. <laughs> okay. It's a small town in mountains of Mexico here in the north in the, in the Sierra. Sierra Madre, in the middle of the mountains. It's a very small town. I, I scared Breeze, tell me the name. Because I used it to come there. And she said, okay, the name of my town is Guayacocotla. It's here, Guayacocotla, it's this town. And I said, oh, I know this town very well. I used to go camping when I was a teenager. Spent a lot of weeks. And, and the amazing thing about this town, I, I really love because you can climb the mountains and see this kind of uh, shows. The, you have these clouds that rise in the morning and the afternoon because you have you have the Atlantic coast here is very warm. You have the range of mountains, so it start the clouds start to climb and they cool adiabatically and they form these very nice patterns. So these are real actual photographs from Guayacocotla, which is this this small town. You can see that you are in the the square of the town and you can see the the clouds rising. This is like a real spectacle. So we started talking about this, and I say I say to her that I was, I think a lot of when I was a student about this kind of pattern, but I was certain that for sure there was a lot of research on that. So she started to look at it, and in fact, it turns out that it was almost a, how do you say, a, a, an open field. There much, much of the work where from two years or five years ago, six years ago, but it was not something that like is not very well known. So we started working on that, but eventually, well, after she made this, uh, this work, undergraduate student, she, she won a scholarship in the International Center for Theoretical Physics. So she, she fly to Europe, which is very nice because she's from this is a very small town in the middle of the mountains in Mexico. But the first thing that she sent to me after the flight under the North Atlantic Ocean, she was very happy because she was able to see this pattern, this roll pattern, that this was very difficult to get. So we took some, some time to get this in our simulations. And you can also see this, for example, this kind of topological defects that you can see here, for example. Yeah. So um, she was very happy. So we, the, uh, so in this talk, basically, I will try to explain why it's important to understand this and how can we understand this using complex systems? Because the people that do atmospheric science, they take a completely different approach. Valid, of course, but different. And of course, uh, global warming, you know, that due to human activities has been recognized somehow with the Nobel Prize and also complex systems and the recent Nobel Prize where they cited this work 
which is basically a Fokker-Planck equation. It's a very simple to understand, in fact, the article. It's a Fokker-Planck equation where some feedbacks and these feedbacks, they, they have different frequency ranges. So if you use them, you can predict the temperature as a function of the uh, uh, content of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If you don't take into account the human, this is the, the model, it's difficult to see. Here we have the calculation, which is the red one. Here, here we have the actual temperature as a function of the year. And here we have the model without this feedback from the carbon dioxide. So you, you see that even the, these small drops are volcanic events like the Popocatépetl that we are having here in this moment. So this decrease the temperature because it's cloudy, but even if you, you need, even if you take into account this, the temperature is rising of the earth. Okay, so if you look at the temperature change in the last 50 years, we can see that uh, that there is a, a warming of the earth and some places are more, are getting warmer than others, the speed of the rising of the temperature. And this is very important due to many factors. So for example, uh, if you look at the production of wheat, it's already going down. So here we, here we have the production in the, during the 2000, 2010, 2020 of the decade, and we see that is decreasing and the population is increase is increasing at the same time so if you look at the uh, in fact the university now has a complete institute dedicated to these kind of things and if you look for example at the projected impact of climate change in the agri agricultural yield you will see that mexico is one of the most affected countries because of the latitude and so on and it's a very dry country especially in the north of mexico and also, you know, there are some predictions that depending on the, 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 the change of temperature, the Antarctica can melt, so the, the sea can rise uh, some, something like 10 meters, 50 meters, something like that, and it can really have, we are talking about maybe two, two millions of people immigrating from cities because most of the population on the Earth lives close to the, to the uh, to the sea or to live or close to the rivers. And also, so in fact, the cloudsphere is, is one of the most important and unknown effects in this prediction of global warming, because it's very, it's too important to be ignored as we're going to discuss, but it's too small to be simulated. So in the actual simulation, it's very difficult to take into, them into account, but if you don't take into account, it, the result can be completely changed. And, and this is also very important to understand the speed of rising temperature because the political, economical decision, all the things depend on how fast is this going to happen. It's going to happen in one, 100 years, 50 years, 15 years, okay? And also there's another thing that a, a lot of people is working, which is a tipping point. And the tipping point is maybe we can warm the earth and everything is going to be like the same, but also, you can reach a point that everything is going to change like in a phase transition. So for example, it's like, I always say this to my students, it's like cooking rice. While you have water, the rice is not going to be burned. But once, because it's a phase transition, so all the heat is used just to make the water to turn into vapor. But once you don't, don't, your uh, water is already vapor, now it begins to heat the wrist, so it burns very, very fast, okay? So this is a tipping point. So if we melt all the ice in the earth, that's a tipping point. Because now all the heat is using to change from, from ice to water. So the temperature is not changing much because it's a phase transition at constant pressure. But once the ice is melted, it's like having ice in a refrigerator with beer or something. It's zero degrees until all the ice melts, then is a dipping one, okay? Because it will. So this is very worrisome. And now, also there's another question that I'm not to, going to talk, but we work a lot. We have many papers on this, uh, which is another question is what about the storms? There are many storms. So for example, this is Hurricane Ida that touched New York in 2021. It's really a catastrophic event. We had some catastrophic events in Mexico City. These are photos from Mexico. I took it from the newspaper. And there is a huge debate if the storms are going to be more frequent with more energy and 
or not. And so it's another debate. So we have some papers on this, for example. This, in fact, we have very just published this one concerning the case of the North Atlantic. You see that here we study the North Pacific because each of the uh, cyclone basins are different, have particularities. You need to read a lot of bibliography to really do. And why, why is this related with global warming? Because you know that hurricanes are basically a Carnot engine. So for example, how does a, a hurricane work? Basically you have your the sea, which is one. Usually it needs to be above 27 degrees. So the air that is in close proximity to the ocean, it begins to heat isothermally at this temperature. So this is an isothermal process. When it reaches a certain point, it, it gets lighter because it's warm air. So it begins to climb. This climbing is very fast, so it's adiabatic. So it goes to to certain layer where the pressure it can spread here. So it begins to cool adiabatically. It well, not adiabatically, sorry. It radiates, it radiates the heat at minus 73 centigrade degree. So it cools down. When it cools down, it begins to be uh, again denser, so it goes down and it again goes down adiabatically. So this is a Carnot cycle, and you can calculate the thermal efficiency of this process. And the thermal efficiency, what is the work? Is the wind that is producing all the destruction, and you can measure this thing. How? You simply take a hurricane, you compute the power, the energy of the winds, multiply it, you integrate over the size of the hurricane and the time of the hurricane. So you get the power of the hurricane, okay? And this, this data is known from satellite and you can download it in the NASA. And then you can, for example, look at the energy for each of the seasons of the hurricane. So for example, here we have uh, a plot. This, this is the accumulated cyclonic energy as a function of the years. You can see that there are very old data. This data is not so reliable. That's another history even for giving a talk, <laughs> but it still is not so bad, this data. But it was based on reports of the ship's captains. So they, they need you to, uh, okay, they use it to ride the speed of the winds and that's the only thing that you need in fact, in the timing. So eventually you can do, for example, the, the different statistical analysis, like for um, example, mobile, mobile windows of different average variability and things like that. And you, for example, you see that in the case of the North Atlantic, you can see that clearly the last years are a little bit different. The average is, is, is going up and also the variability. And one thing that a very interesting result that we found that in fact, if you look at the distribution function for, especially for the good data, it, it's what uh, depends on the size of many things, but the variability depends on the average. So that means that that's for the North Atlantic, this data. This is very, very clear. In fact, this, see, we didn't found this for the North Pacific. In fact, in the North Pacific, we didn't get any evidence of any effect of global warming. But in the Atlantic, we have some evidence. And one of the things that we found is the more, the more the average grows, the more variability you have, okay? That means that there are going to be more extreme years, not like one year is going to be catastrophic, the next one maybe is going to be quiet, so on. This is the thing that, we're, but I'm not going to talk much about this thing. So, uh, <clears throat> so why, why is important the clouds for global warming? In fact, they are essential. There's something that is called the uh, equilibrium climate sensibility, which tells you what is the time that a model needs to reach uh, an equilibrium after you duplicate the content of carbon dioxide. So you take your model, duplicate the quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and then you look what is the time that it will give you new, uh, new, uh, uh, new equilibrium, okay? And then you look at the different parameters that your model has, and you look at the, the uncertainty and that, and that thing, okay? And this is very important because this plot, give you the different different results of different models, okay? And this will produce, and this is the year where you predict that you will cross the threshold of two centigrade degrees, which is when it's going to be more catastrophic events and so on. So some models, they predict that it's going to be in 2060, others in 2042. So you see that they, they occur in groups in fact. But this factor, this one that is here, 
the most important and most uh, that the people is not in, in agreement is the cloud covering. Because if you could, if, well, we're going to see in the next slide, but basically, so for example, this uh, reflectance change due to, due to the clouds, it can be a positive, some models predict that this is a positive feedback and which uh, positive feedback and defiant feedback and the other says the other. It's the other way around. If you, if you want more the atmosphere, you are going to have less clouds and then you are have less reflectivity and the, the earth is going to be more, more, and more uh, warmer, okay? But all it says is the other way around, okay? Because you are going to have more evaporation, you have more, you are going to have more clouds. If you have more clouds, you have uh, more reflectivity, so the temperature goes down. So half of the model says one thing, half of the model say the other, okay? And so this is the most important thing that is not contained in any model of, just they put like a number, no? Let, let's put this reflectivity discovery and let's see what's happened. The problem is that your conditions depends on the reflectivity. That's uh, the thing that we are trying to understand. And also, let, let me show you another thing. Okay, so for example, just for to put some numbers, if you change by three or 5% the area of cloud covering, you change, you, it, that's enough for, for compensate for all the carbon dioxide that is given by the human. So it's very small change. So it's very, very sensitive. Okay. So. Uh, yes, a lot of global is a lot, but in the simulation is not a lot because the problem is that. Yeah, it's a lot, yeah. But it's not this, yeah, three three percent, yeah, you can have it. If you yeah, you can have it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why it's very uncertain in the reasons. Couple of the most say what I mean if you do that calculation you can see that it can it can they don't do it. Sorry, what was the answer? <laughs> that if you put in more, more, more clouds, then the, the effect of those will be enough to compensate for all the carbon dioxide. Yeah, that, that's that, yeah, that's the school of thought of the uh, negative feedback. But there are other factors that they, they say that is more important, that they is positive. That, that's a discussion. It's not an easy, it's like with the same with the hurricanes. You say this with the hurricanes, they're not in gene, very nice, but you look at the data, it's not clear because there are so many things. Yeah, so the like Nino, La Nina, <laughs> really very tricky, this kind of thing. Anyway, um, the thing is, is that the simulation, the models, they, they, they put a grid and they do some simulation, but the grid is very, when you look at the, the size of the, of the earth, okay? It's very difficult to simulate. Even the, say for tomorrow, what is going to be the cloud covering in Mexico City is almost impossible, yeah? Okay? So everything, so in, imagine for the next 50 years is going to be, but it's almost impossible, <laughs> very difficult. So the, the thing is that the mesh grid that the people use in the simulation is too big to simulate this kind of thing. And the people who do atmospheric science, they have huge models with hundreds of parameters. They put, the, uh, it's not clear what, at all what, what is they are obtaining. Yeah, that's why I say that it is too important to be neglected, but too difficult to be simulated. Yeah. So we need to really go to another approach. Uh, so the most important clouds are the ones that we are going to study, which are the stratocumulus. Stratocumulus, these are kind of clouds that are, let's say, start at 2,000 meters and to 4,000. They're, they're like cumulus because they have a certain width and they can, you can, you can see that you can have, for example, patterns like this, bands pattern, you can uh, sparse clouds, you can have a, uh, a closed cell uh, pattern, this is called closer, okay? And these uh, stratocumulus, they cover one over five of the Earth's surface, if you average during the year, 
So this is the dominant type of cloud in the air. So this is more or less the covering of the clouds. You see, for example, that in the in the oceans close to the continents, but in the, the place where the wind comes in this direction, you see that you have the most covering, okay? Um, no, this is just like the covering, total covering of, of the cloud, of these kind of, of things, stratocumulus, okay? Because you can... 2,000 starts. Um, so you see that they form this beautiful pile, also. okay? And they are very, is, they are really uh, reflect a lot of the radiation, around 30 and 60%, okay? So, um, so they are very important for the energy budget of the planet. Mm -hmm. So really very tricky thing. And I'm on too, too slow, sorry. <laughs> very slow way. So, so basically the physics base uh, is like this. You have insulation from the sun, which is a constant. It's very not around, it's like a microwave oven around 500 watts per meter square. So you have the ultraviolet part of the spectrum go through the clouds. Some parts can be reflected inside uh, due to aerosol, things like that. And then the earth warms up and release heat but in the infrared. And in this, in, this, uh, in this frequency, the cloud is like a, like a window, okay? It's like, that, what, that's the name of, uh, it's why it's called the greenhouse effect because it's like having a greenhouse, okay? So uh, warmer, the nights where you have clouds are usually warmer when you, because they reflect the, the, and of course you have the long way cooling because the, the ultraviolet, uh, the, sorry, the infrared that comes from the sun just gets, can be reflected. And there are some theories of, of, of what is the effect of lower warming. I am not going to talk because I'm really very slow today. Maybe it's because of the hour <laughs> and the food. But well, so some people say that, for example, that if, uh, if you, the prediction is that the, the clouds, the stratocumulus are going to disappear like this, and this will produce another eight degrees, which are additional to the two, th two degrees <laughs> obtained from the simulation without taking into account carbon. So this effect can be even worse than, than uh, it's a very tiny effect. By the way, for example, the people discovered that the reflectivity of, of the snow changed a lot due to the smoke. We are producing also smoke, carbon and they change the reflectivity of the ice in the poles. And this increase a lot the uh, warming because it's like a little bit, the albedo is not as it used to be. So that's responsible for a lot of the global warming, for example. So there are very tiny details which were not known, which are important. So, um, so what we are trying to do, are we, our idea is to, okay, the people are doing very complex models. This is very complicated. We cannot simulate, but what we can do from the complex side, complex system perspective. So the idea is, okay, we are not going to solve very complicated equation. We are going to think in an ordered parameter and some parameters and we are going to build a phase diagrams of the patterns that you will observe. So if you give me the humidity, the speed of wind, for example, uh, pressure, temperature of the oceans, things like that, I will predict you what is the covering of the cloud that you will observe in your model? So you can, we take the data from the model, we predict some covering and, and that can just like, it's like a black box. That's, a, that's our idea. And why? Because you can go to the NASA satellite uh, uh, website, you download the photos and you get this kind of pattern. So for example, here we have, we can have this pattern which are very disorganized. We can have these very open patterns and we have also these clouds which start to build like a, like a pattern, but you can have these very, very close phases. So we want to, we wanted to understand if it was possible to use a phase, uh, phase diagram of this kind of thing. Okay. So this is the thing that I'm going to tell you in the rest of my talk. If there are no questions or something. 
And of course, there are many different uh, things that you need to take into account for me make a model. It's very complicated, the physics of the clouds. I mean, it's physics that you know, it's physics. Uh, undergraduate uh, level, let's say, but a lot of different things. Like, for example, you have this cooling, you have turbulence in the cloud, you have precipitation, you have many different fluxes from the flu of energy, heat content, phase transition, pressure, interaction of, of the cloud with the rest of the atmosphere and so on. Many, many different things. So uh, also you have some convection activities, like when you, this is the Raleigh Bernard convection that you will observe when you hit water, for example, some some uh, some part of the mass of air, for example, climbs where it's getting warmer, but all that goes on and they tend to form these cells of convection that I call Raleigh state, that produce this kind of patterns here. So by, by the way, the people that fly these uh, things, you know, for example, in Bayer Bravo, they know very well because they know, they look at the clouds and they were no, they know how they need to fly to find the currents, or also the animals, so yields. Okay, they can read the clouds really. They, in fact, they call it the cloud creek, the people that fly these things. So, um, I'm sorry, wait. So we, when we started doing this, we started doing some research and we were very surprised to find that the articles were in science and nature, but from 2017, 18, and the people do the things that we thought, uh, we thought at the beginning, for example, like use Boronoi polyedra for describing these patterns and geometric properties or use oscillators. Even we thought in using Turing, we knew the words from Rafael on, Fish patterns, thing like that. So I say, okay, let's try to do the Turing equation. Some, some people are doing Turing equation, but we found that this was the, the way that I'm going to show is, I think that we, well, for us is was nicer because it's, it's more like transparent and you can do a lot of things analytically, which is very surprising. It's such a complex problem. No, no. <laughs> no, they're just. There's a paper this year where they did clouds pattern with Turing equations, and but after hours, they cite our paper, and they say that our paper is really good. <laughs> the same thing that you say. But anyway, um, the important thing was to put our foot in the problem, foot. foot. <laughs> so basically, we did a model to describe all the uh, um, process that you have. So. The basic equation is very, very simple. You have that the idea was to use the content of vapor of water in a column as a function of the position and time. Okay? So this is this is going to be like our order parameter of the phase transition. Okay? And we are going to in my our main assumption is that this movement, this water vapor is associated with the air that has a certain uh, velocity as a function of the temperature and time, okay? This is the velocity of the air, and this is the water content of the air, okay? So the mass, this, we basically you start just putting a batch of the equation. You say, okay, the change of this humidity, okay, which is a function of space and time, is equal to the sources, okay? Sources of humidity, you can have rain, for example, this is reduced, but you can have, evaporation, so this is increasing and so on. This is very simple. And this, this is something that is, since this is a field, to calculate the temporal derivative, you need to use something that is called the convex, uh, convective derivative that takes into account that when you change from position, you have a change in time and in position, okay? So this is, you express this, like you have, this is just a partial in time and you have the coupling of this with the speed of, of the air. And here you have the source terms. So the next, the next trick is to divide the order parameter in, in an average part that goes slowly and you have some fluctuation. And then you end up having this equation, okay? Which is exact, there's no, like, any approximation at this moment, it's a, this one. And at some point, the thing that you need to do is go to the literature and see how these, all these terms can be simulated, okay? So for example, this one, which is in, in this one, which is the blue, correspond to this time, is related to the turbulence. It's a very short fluctuation, and this is 
So the most simple model that, that you can do is just suppose that it's like a Laplacian. It's very, very, so if you look at this first part of the equation, it's simply a diffusion equation. So the cloud just diffuse and that's it, okay? Just a turbulence mixing is diffusing. There is no cloud anymore. But you have other things that, for example, the feeding by the sun, which is in this case is a constant, yeah? And also you have other things like, for example, you can have a land or you can have the sea or many different things. So what we add is a random term here, which is going to be stochastic noise. And here we have a relaxation time for the clouds. So eventually what you get, and these parameters are not so crazy. I mean, these are, you can find the, the literature estimation of these parameters. So it's not completely arbitrary as one might think. So more or less, this is the, how these things work. So for example, second term, which is a fusion is related with turbulent mixing in the clouds. So this term that is here, this term, which is the relaxation, the stochastic feedback and the uh, uh, constant sources term are related to precipitation, the evaporation and cooling. So this is the main equation that we are going to work, okay? And the other thing that you need to do is, it is known that once the vapor reach 65 uh, millimeters or certain heat content, you see that the water condensated and forms the cloud that look, looks white because this phenomena of critical opalescence, which is a fractal that disperses all wavelengths. And that's why you see the, the cloud white. Do you agree? Because, <laughs> Yeah, so you see when you reach certain critical, so you, so what you need is basically, we did the simulation of this equation, okay? With this equation, and once you reach this uh, critical thing, you just, it's like a spin, okay? So sigma is the water content. Once you reach 65, you say that this is one and this is zero. Okay, so basically you produce this kind of pattern. Okay. In fact, you can show analytically the, that in fact this distribution is like an it's more or less like a, an easy model, by the way. So it looks if you put colors to the clouds, it looks like this. But we put a certain threshold, which is sixty-five, and then you get this. So th you can compare. So this is more or less. You can see that, for example, open fields we can get it right. Open cell, more or less. And pockets of open cell, okay, we, we get these things, but still you still you begin to see some structure. And you look at closed cell is like, uh, I don't know how to say in English, but it's like borregos. What do you say? It? <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. like skin of the lamp, okay? And, and you miss it completely in this thing, okay? In our simulations. In fact, we were able to do analytically the phase diagram of the cloud covering that is here. Yes, thank you. It's the very most annoying. Uh, very annoying, yeah, yeah. in fact. Very thank you. It's that's the most important part of my talk, the change of <laughs> because it's <laughs> okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. So basically you end up making a, a phase diagram where you have the only parameters is this parameter D of the stochastic noise, okay, and the constant source, and then you can Calculate analytically the, the phase diagram, okay? Close it and it's like a phase transition, very similar to the one that you see in an easy model. And this, with that, you can calculate the cloud covering analytically from this model. But, okay, this is very nice, but because now we found a way to predict, but we were very uh, ambitious. Now I forget that. <laughs> Sorry. We were very ambitious because we say, okay, that kind of lamp, skin patterns, we are not able to see them. That's for sure. So one thing I say to Diana, what we need to do first is to take, what is the structure of real cloud? So we downloaded many photos and we took the Fourier transform of the photos, which surprisingly nobody did it, but uh, well, I was very surprised. I thought, I thought that maybe one Russian or something. <laughs> but anyway, so these are the results. So for example, you take different cloud patterns. So for example, open field and you see very nice Fourier transform. There's no special frequency. But if you go to these close skin lamp patterns, you see that you see very clearly that you start having Fourier components that produce, are the responsible to produce the different kind of pattern, okay? So this is the Fourier transform, this amplitude, and this is the 
spatial frequency. Okay, so there are some spatial frequencies that are selected that produce the pattern. Okay, so if you look at, at uh, the two dimensional thing, this is the result that you obtain. So for example, for these, uh, you see that there is a lot of the structure. This is, for example, that means that this is very close to roll convection where you, the patterns is like in one dimension and, and this, these are more like uniform isotropic patterns. And of course, here you don't see anything, but these, these frequencies are here. Okay. These frequencies are around in real photos around 10 kilometers, five kilometers. That's the order of magnitude. By the way, this is very tricky to do because there's something about the mesh resolution. But anyway, you can spend like two months <laughs> doing these plots. So we were very like, well, it's very nice, but we want to have these skin patterns, which is really the pattern formation, which this is, uh, so we just say, okay, we have the order parameter. If the order parameter is like, we can do like, there are a lot of theories in physics about phase transition or the parameters. So the most famous one is Landau, Gizmo Landau. So is it possible to get something from this model? And the answer is yes. What we did is, okay, we have our order parameter, which usually the variation in time of the order parameter depends on some function, which usually is something that is a differential operator and something that is a function. And this can be linear and nonlinear. So this is a linear function in the model that I present. So we have the uh, linear oper the differential operator is the Laplacian, which is the turbulence. And then we have this random noise, uh, the noise, sorry, random is noise, the sources and the damping. But we say, okay, this will never produce a pattern because it's the, it's the distribution of the other ISO model. And in fact, we look at the literature because the thing in our model is that one, once you reach a certain threshold, humidity is going to start raining, for example, and this will change. So this is like a threshold. So our model was continuous, purely continuous function, we see. But here we see that there is a threshold. So for example, there are many works that report that. So for example, sample, for example, here we have humidity and here we have the probability of raining. And this is a lot of uh, average taken on time and space, whatever. In, the ocean during 10 years from satellite, that very difficult work. But basically you can see that once you reach the 65 that I told you, then you, you have rain, okay? And once it begins raining, it goes down because of course all the, the need to fall down through it. So we need to put this inside the model. That's what we did. Basically we, we did a rain model. Okay, we say we have our sources, we need to multiply by this function. But this function is, a, is which is, uh, this parameter is basically our icing spin is one or zero, okay? But we say, okay, we are going to think in a mean field. We are going to say, okay, we, if we reach certain humidity, it's going to be rain, but you, you need to know the solution of the model in order to know if it's raining or not. So how can we overcome this? So I say, okay, in this model, you solve that, you replace, your thing by by a uh, mean field model and your mean field model in the ISO model is a hyperbolic tangent, which is precisely a threshold thing. So, okay, we put the hyperbolic tangent with, as a function of humidity and temperature. And then since we are interested in the change of phase, we expand this, this hyperbolic tangent of this. So you take the first terms. So the surprise is that you end up having precisely a Gisbol of the equation Okay, I did some tricks because uh, perhaps it just shifted and course, right. yeah, because an easy he needs minus one plus one, but here is like uh, in this mo oh sorry. Where is it? Okay, so this is the model. So basically that's a uh, term that goes to the I mean, you can do it like, like Landau. You can say, okay, just for symmetry needs to be, <laughs> but we're not very happy with that. So anyway, this is a model where you include the nonlinearity and this is due to the rain, the threshold of the rain, which is very natural somehow, okay? So you put that. Um, so if you compare with the linear model, so this is the real cloud patterns of different uh, parts of phase diagram. This is the linear model. And this is the non-linear one, okay? So you see that, for example, this begins to be more like the real things, but still you don't see this skin 
skin lamp pattern. Okay. Well, this is the phase diagram that you produce with the Ginzburg equation, which, by the way, is used to describe the phase transition in superconductors, where the order parameter is the wave function of the condensate. So anyway, we, uh, this is the phase diagram, the, the kind of pattern you get as a function of the parameter D and F, which are not completely crazy. I mean, these parameters, the people have some idea, I mean, from the data you can infer. So this is like a phase diagram that things that you get, for example, if D is very, is very strong, that means that you, your random things is going to dominate, okay? And if D is very small, you will get what well, you will get from the usable and the equation. Yeah, which eventually in two dimension is basically eventually is nothing. But uh, is it so? The interesting thing for the things that we are producing are in the middle, when the noise goes more or less like the pattern formation. And these are the Fourier transform of these uh, new things that from this each of this one. Okay, so for each this this you see this, uh, and you can see that you have Fourier peaks here but are not strong enough to explain the real world, okay? So the next step was to use, okay, we realized that closed cells, when you have closed cell, you have very strong convection. So the point is that it seems to be that you cannot simulate turbulence anymore with the Laplacian, it's too not good. So, so looking at the literature, there's something that is called a sweep hockenberg equation that is, is spare. <laughs> An equation that is used very much for button formation, but its origin, its uh, its origin is in the um, Benar equation, Benar cell convection solution of a fluid, and basically you replace the Laplacian by this term, which is like Laplacian and the square here, and you have a parameter, and the parameter here is the way that you are you are going to select. Okay. So one, one, one of the, let's say one of the um, special frequencies are selected and this is stable and the other goes down. So this describes uh, this, this uh, convection, strong convection. So basically we have this equation plus the noise here, okay? And there was, some, by the way, I, I learned that this guy is the same that using the Hohenberg sham uh, theory, which, uh, which is the DFT theory, is the same guy. And I also learned that he was a champion of swim and like kind of Superman in physics and in real life. <laughs> anyway, but he's not so famous like Einstein or someone, but he's, he's, uh, well, anyway, so these are the results and I'm finishing here. So this is the, uh, when you take, for example, the closed uh, pattern, of clouds with the skin lamp pattern. You take the Fourier transform, you look at the cut of the Fourier transform, you see these, these peaks at around um, 10 kilometers. By the way, the size of this photograph from the satellite is 2000, 200 by 200 kilometers, okay? These are taken from the NASA website. And you can see very nicely of, of this pattern, exactly you can see this, this pattern here, okay? I tell you that there's some, some degree of anisotropy. It's not completely. So this is the linear model. Of course, there is nothing. There is no Fourier extra peak. This is the Gisbo Landau peak, uh, the Gisbo Landau model, which is nice, but not really. The Fourier transfer is not very nice. But once you, you put the conv strong convection, you get this very thing that really looks very nicely. And you get these peaks here, which are very close to the uh, to the real ones. And here you see that you form this thing, okay? But then another thing that we thought well, very nice is the photo that Diana took. Well, this is from the satellite, of course, not the same one, a similar one. <clears throat> you have this kind of rolls. These rolls form, for example, in the east coast of the United States into the ocean. So uh, you take the Fourier transfer, they look like this, it's very anisotropic, you see. And if you compare with our, some of the parameters that they use it, we, we can see that we have the road, we have the anisotropy, we see this Fourier transfer, and also we see this kind of topological difference that we saw in the photograph. We have two roads lying that coalesce and goes into one, things like that. Okay. 
So conclusions are that, well, conclusion was the clouds are very nice and very beautiful patterns. And it's surprising that it's so recent, this subject of research, and I'm really, I'm very surprised. And you can do a lot of nice uh, physics, but the interesting thing is that at the beginning, we had a lot of discussion with the people of the Atmospheric Science Institute and Climate whatever uh, Institute and UNAM. And no, your model is not good because, <laughs> you know, they don't like these kind of things. They're too simple, too simple. But, but at the end, they realized that there is something in this kind of efforts because somehow at the end, when you have this kind of renormalization that you have many things, but at the end you have, like in sociophysics, you have something that really, um, I would like to say some praise that a former professor who founded our department, I mean, I culture, he used to say a phrase from Komogorov, he said, there is nothing more predictable than the sum of many unpredictable things, okay? So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Gerardo. I think I should have said in the beginning, just let me make you a small remark, that Gerardo was some time ago Rafael student. So we are having a day of professors, students that are becoming professors. What? Yes, yes, it was, it was some time ago. <laughs> okay, so we have some time for questions. I think Kimo has one. It's more like a comment about this uh, climate uh, climate change in general. I was uh, a few days ago in a in a conference, a European uh, climate change conference, uh, and uh, I had to give a presentation there about climate change, which I'm not a, any kind of climatologist, but I consulted with a climatologist and uh, the. Uh, uh, got their, their slides and presented their slides. The one uh, most important uh, findings for me was that uh, uh, there's also a natural greenhouse effect, which is uh, very important for our life. And without this natural greenhouse effect due to uh, CO2, uh, 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 our surface temperature uh, I mean, average surface temperature on Earth would be something like minus, minus 18 degrees centigrade. So you can imagine that, uh, that uh, living in Finland in that kind of average uh, temperature would, uh, would make it uh, rather difficult. But because of this uh, uh, natural greenhouse effect, uh, uh, our average surface temperature around the globe is plus 14 degrees, which makes uh, makes the thing, makes the, our planet habitable. And, uh, and uh, then of course the clouds have an important effect on, on, on this. But then uh, there's also uh, things happening like the aerosol particle formation, which affect the climate change. Uh, uh, a lot accumulation and kind of a uh, uh, nucleation of uh, 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 particles and, uh, and and so on, which got, uh, kind of work as a centers of centers of uh, uh, nucleating uh, clouds with uh, with pollutants and uh, so on. So uh, uh, I guess you haven't taken these things into account, but I mean. Uh, uh, I, I would think that that would be important to try to model kind of natural effects plus what is happening now because of the additional CO2. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, okay. Let me take it. Oh, I have a microphone. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, uh, you have it with you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the comments. That's, uh, it's funny about the global warming because before the war in Ukraine, everybody was worried about global warming. Now we have the war and everybody begins to burn coal and I <laughs> get anymore <laughs> about the global warming. But it's true, there is a natural global warming. There have been changes in the history of the earth. 
And you, will, you can also look to the cases, the case of Venus, where the warming, global warming effect is so huge that it is 400 uh, centigrade, the, so strong. So it's the other extreme. Okay, so there, for example, you have, you can have, uh, for example, a volcano. If you have a volcano, they will, during one year, it's going to go down the temperature, things like that. The other one was the fluctuation of the, for example, the sun. There is a cycle in the sun. In fact, the hurricane, we have another work that correlates the spots in the sun with the activity because when you have the spots in the sun, the, the, the radiation from the sun is weaker, so that changes the balance. And so the thing that uh, Kim was saying, in fact, we have been discovering effects and effects and effects. That, that's what makes the thing very complicated, okay? So uh, in my opinion, okay, we need to, I think the best policy is to apply the policy of, as we don't know, it's very, it's, it's better to be conservative about it. because if this is true, it's going to be very bad. If it's not true, okay, we can survive and there's no problem. But I agree. I mean, if you look at the old paper from the last century, we have been discovering many, many effects. But the thing that chemo, but I think one of the things that the people is worried is about the rate of change because the rate of change, I mean, there have been periods in the year where the amount of CO2 was very huge. But the thing is, that's why I talk about the speed of change. And that's very important in the models. If this speed is, you know, 200 years, maybe we can adapt the society, the food, and so on. But is it, if this thing is going to happen in 20 years, it's going to be a disaster for the agriculture. And I think Kimo wants to say something. <laughs> Okay, let, 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 if you can give him the microphone. Let me tell you that greenhouse effect chemo is just like many things in life. You know, a certain amount is good. If you exaggerate, it becomes bad. Okay, let me give you, let me give you the microphone. So. Huh? I stay. Yeah, I think I, I don't. I don't like propaganda, and I think in the recent years, the topic of climate change has been actually full of propaganda. Because I mean, they want the politicians to make something quick to in order to change the state of affairs. But what you mentioned is quite important. We saw that in two thousand and three. A lot of people died in Europe because of heat, right? Mm -hmm. Very hot summer. And that was because there were no, no stains, uh, how do you call it, the spots in the sun mm -hmm. in 2003. And nowadays, if you look at the sun, there are no spots either. So I mean that this very hot summer that we had last year and this year is because of, uh, or, uh, not because of that, but actually due to the increase in solar radiation. And you know, obviously, I mean, if uh, it's undeniable, this uh, rough in the temperature, but uh, you have to be careful to, to see. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, the circuit that schema presented is like a circuit with many feedbacks. And... <laughs> okay. I also disagree, but we can discuss that later because we have one hour of discussion after this talk. But please, which is your question? Okay. Uh... <laughs> Professor, what is the difference or what is the relation between these uh, kinds of models and the morphogenesis of, from Turing? Oh, okay. Well, the original model of, of uh, okay. In the model of Turing, you need to have two, two quantities for the field, let's say. You have like, like you have different chemical species that react and, okay. So you can, okay, you need to find two, <laughs> two things in your field to describe and how they interact, okay? So we thought that it was much more complex. There is a paper they wrote to us and cited us, whatever. I, I didn't read it to really, but the main difference is that here we only use one parameter, but in the equation you have different chemical. It was originally invited by Turing like that. You have different chemicals and they react and they, these are the ones that they have different diffusion constants, so these produce this kind of patterns. Okay, so you need to imagine how to relate that with clouds. It's like a big jump. Is there any other question specifically about Gerardo's talk? 
if there is not okay so perhaps no i think he asked already uh -huh. okay